thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we can get started with the panel. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and thank you panelists for being a part of this. Um, we've been doing this, um, Angela, you can talk about it a little bit, but I will say that um, Angela had this fantastic idea of just you know, talking about like trainee programs, story design, and maybe something in the future. But Angela, what was the impetus for that, um, for that idea, do you think? Sure thing. So thanks, thanks, Bobby. And thank you to Abigail and Shannon and Alyssa and everyone attending. So the idea yeah. came from in the Rise Up Discord, as well as the Black and Animated Discord, Anim Asians, various discords, also on Twitter and Instagram. I would see a lot of people who were applying for internships and training programs and jobs, and they had a lot of questions and they were asking how do I get in? What is the program like? What will we be doing? How many pieces do I need to have in my portfolio? And especially when all the application processes were open, everybody was understandably nervous and terrified. And so I came to Bobby and said, this is something that our community is asking about a lot. Can we have people who were in these programs come and speak to that? And Bobby said, absolutely, which is awesome. And that's how, that's how this whole ball started to get rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, you met Angela, but she's going to be uh, graciously uh, agreed to be my co-moderator today. So I'll embarrass you a little bit. Um, <laughs> Angela. So Angela Insminger is a story artist uh, at Nickelodeon on uh, Santiago and the Seas. Uh, seas? Santiago of the Seas, yes. Santiago of the Seas. I know words. Um, <laughs> She's a TV writer and artist who's also worked on uh, My Adventures with Superman for HBO Max, uh, The Loud House, and uh, like we previously mentioned, uh, working as a story artist on Santiago and the Siege, which is a new gig for you, right? Congrats. Yes, yes. I have been on the show for a month and it's, it's been mm -hmm. great. So first four weeks, first four weeks are going great. Got to meet all my crew over Zoom. They're lovely. Yeah. If you're working on a show about pirates in a boat, everything becomes a pun. So <laughs> crews, teams, like all that, you, you can't like help ocean it. puns? Yes, okay. lots of boat puns all the time. Cool. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to introduce our panelists. Um, and I, I figured um, we can kind of go around and we can hot potato. So if you would, um, I'll start with Abigail. If you can start with where you are now, and what the training program, where the training program you went through was, and then you can pass it off to someone else. Abigail, take it away. All right, uh, right now I'm a, I'm a contracted illustrator and concept artist at Facebook, nice. Facebook Inc. Uh, right here in Menlo Park, except we're all working remotely because of COVID. And uh, previously, my, I was at Nickelodeon in 2018 for the Nickelodeon Artist Program, which is located in Burbank, California. Nice, nice. All right, cool. Uh, do you want to pass, we can go with Alyssa? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Alyssa Taylor. I actually just wrapped on a show, uh, My Dad the Bounty Hunter at Netflix. Um, thank you, just, Thank you, yeah. It was just this last Friday too, so it's still like, Oh no! Really fresh, yeah. It's oh, I mean, really oh yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, but no, I mean it was fantastic. But yeah, I just wrapped on My Dad the Bounty Hunter at Netflix, and before that, I was a trainee at Netflix on the same production, My Dad the Bounty Hunter. Yeah, in okay. California, but it's all been remote. So. <laughs> oh, oh! You never, you never came down to California. Yeah, yeah. So this whole, uh, yeah, this whole experience was done virtually, which was wow. like surprisingly smooth. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's the whole thing. I'm sure we'll get there. But Shannon, okay. <laughs> you're up. <laughs> Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon. I was first on the Nick Artist Program in 2020 during the wonderful pandemic year. And then um, I joined full time as background designer on the Loud House. And then I recently, like the last three or four months, I've been at Disney TV on the Proud Family. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Welcome to Disney TV. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing so what do you think angela so we, yeah okay, keep going. go ahead yeah let's, let's jump in let's jump here so, so again thank you everyone for coming so we have we have a, a let's see question so <coughs> excuse me as i cough i don't want to cough into the microphone 
One I've second. Had, I've had I, I've had um, executives and coworkers like do exactly that. Like I, one of my development directors, he he had like a a headset, and he would be like, <laughs> Oh no! And then he'd be like, Okay. <laughs> it's like and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pretend that you didn't just like because he was like a big wig and yeah I yeah. would always be like oh my god yeah so, so <laughs> no one no one's gonna talk about that okay. there's a mute button <laughs> there's a mute button that you can click on and off like in two seconds and you didn't have the guy anyway sorry go okay so now now that I'm no longer coughing on camera so <laughs> the number one question that we get all the time is what do you put in a design portfolio? And specifically, how many pieces to what level of completion do they want to see works in progress? Do you need to draw in the style of the studio? Do you do your own style? What is included in that? Mm -hmm. And anyone can go first. Uh, oh, like, I'm <laughs> I know I don't. Listen, <laughs> your lips start to talk, so allow me first. Go ahead. Okay. Um. So okay, portfolio setup. Yeah. Uh, I think based and like this is just going to be based on like my experience because obviously like I'm still so new to the industry. Like I'm not the person that reviews the portfolios, so I'm gonna go off of information from when I've talked to my mentors about like what they liked about my portfolio since. Those are like the types of people that will be making these decisions. Yeah. Um, so they said that they liked that uh, for my position, I applied for like at the time, the art trainee position at Netflix was advertised as a prop designer position. So I worked on um, a prop design portfolio first and foremost. I was like pedal to the metal with props. But then I also knew um, in the long run, my goal is viz dev and more like background environment type work. So after I completed more prop design stuff, I did that. And in my portfolio, I just have different tabs for each of those. So like if I applied for different positions, it's really easy for recruiters to just click on what they want to see and that's it. They said that they actually really liked that because at My Dad the Bounty Hunter, it's a CG show. And they were like, yeah, we may or may not throw different stuff at you like we don't really know but we like that you showcase the ability like if we did want to throw something else at you you're able to do it so i would say like know what the job position is for have an organized portfolio but then like um it's sometimes good to show range and like a breadth of what you can do that was something that they liked about my portfolio even though at first it was just supposed to be props Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah similarly I think I also had a pretty like range in my portfolio mostly because I didn't know what I wanted to do which is kind of why I applied to the training program because I wasn't sure what like job I really wanted at the end of the day um but one of the things that I felt like I did specifically was I just tried to make like a nice clean presentation so I created like a very like instead of just like images being shoved up into like the drive or whatever, I like created like basic kind of like a little booklet where there's like a start page to like introduce who I am and kind of like went through it in a way that felt like clean and professional. Um, so it looked like I was really catering to their studio and their job by just like putting their studio name in the bottom of the corner or like my name and my number just for like cleanliness and clarity. Um, but Ultimately, with a portfolio, especially with training positions, it's so hard because really who's picking out the end of the day is your mentor and what your mentor is looking for or the opportunity that you're actually going to be picked for is like very, very up in the air. Um, so knowing exactly what to pick is kind of confusing for the most part for the rest of the other trainees that were in design positions at my studio um, in 2020. They also had a pretty big range. And I think that just allows the mentor to be able to see how they can fit you because if you do like maybe you have an amazing character design like training portfolio and you're you're applying for like a general biz dev position mm -hmm. but they don't actually need a character design uh, mm -hmm. trainee so they're not really going to pick you because maybe they're actually looking for someone specific for background mm -hmm. and there are some positions that are more specific like for example with Alyssa it said prop design so it was easier for her to like 
like create a prop design portfolio, whereas some general biz dev ones are kind of more vague. So I wouldn't, I would just say, put your best foot forward. Like, what do you want to do? What do you feel strong in? What work are you the most proud of? And put that in your portfolio first. And like the number, like five pieces to 20 pieces or however, whatever the range is, I feel like it doesn't really matter. As long as you're putting your best foot forward and the work that you feel the most strong about, um, that's pretty much what I would do at least. But yeah. Yeah. That was another thing that was said in my interview too, just to piggyback. Cause I totally agree was another thing they had told me was all the pieces in your portfolio are good. They were just looking for like no weak links. Everything was about at the same level and nothing was like, Oh, this one's all right. It all has to be kind of at the same as what they had said. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, adding to what Shannon said, like, if you know what your strength is, or you know what, um, what you can build your portfolio around, definitely do that for me. That was character design. So I, and I knew that that's, that was, if I could pick any like role at a TV animation studio, it'd be character designer. So I made sure that my portfolio emphasized character design. There were more character designs than any, anything else, um, but there was a little bit of everything because ultimately I would like to be a visual development artist. So I had some environments, I had some props. I had um, very important is like story moments, like paintings that show a scene in your story, in your movie, in your show that you're designing. And then something that was really, really valuable and for me, like in my portfolio, as far as interviewing, um, was having a continuous story and that, that runs through your portfolio. So like I designed one story, it's called Monster Camp. So all the characters and the props and the environments and everything that I designed, they were from that, that movie, you know, like, like it, it was um, a story that I came up with. Um, or you can like, take a fairy tale, an existing property and put your spin on it. Mm-hmm. But that, that was something you don't have to do that, but that was something that um, in my experience, interviews have really, interviewers have really liked because it, it look your portfolio ends up looking like a, you know, like those, the art of books that come out with every Pixar, Disney, every animated movie. Um, that's what the portfolio ends up looking like. It's you're thinking through the whole visual development of one story. Um, yeah. I will say, I will say, sorry, Ange, go ahead. No, no. All I said was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that uh, the biggest like piece of advice when I got to like, uh, I came to Disney feature as like a character animator and I was like, Oh, I also like to draw though guys. Uh, so I would, a badger everyone upstairs within the biz dev department of just can you guys take a look at my portfolio and uh, there's this guy named Bill Schwab who sort of designed Olaf and Rugged Ralph and uh, Vanellope and all that kind of stuff he looked at my portfolio I showed him my character design portfolio it was just a bunch of desperate uh, disparate um, character um, like pages right of just kind of like here's one character here's one character here's one character and um, the biggest piece of advice that he gave me, and I always tell it to people, um, whether whether I think it holds up or not, is like, he was like, well, I mean, like, all of your pages were kind of disparate, right? So, like, what he recommended was, like, to just take a story, like you were saying, Abigail, and um, kind of get into the nuts and bolts of that story. Your own spin on um, Wizard of Oz or Alice in Wonderland or... Um, uh, uh, you know, a Jungle Book or whatever. And he said the advantage of that is that um, everybody knows what the story of Jungle Book and uh, Alice in Wonderland and Wizard of Oz is, right? You're just showing them in your design portfolio, your take on that, right? Um, and so, and that's, he's like, that's essentially what Disney does anyway, right? You know, you know, Snow Queen is Frozen and Little Mermaid and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, it kind of got me, I never thought about it that before of just kind of structuring my portfolio instead of just a bunch of like random illustrations as a character designer, but kind of like making it project based. Mm-hmm. So, you know, exactly what you said again, Abigail, just kind of like getting into the project of like, this is my take on a certain uh, well-known story, you know? And, yeah. And this what is- that also, Go ahead. What that also does is, um 
since you're developing this one story on your portfolio, you get the opportunity to explore who your characters are, mm-hmm. who, what their what their arc is, what their development is as mm-hmm. they go through this movie that you've come up with. And when they ask you in an interview, tell me about your characters, you'll be able to say, well, this is such and such. And she was, she's from here. And then she embarks on this adventure. And then she, her inner fears are this and that, and her favorite food is this. I mean, I even talked about my character's favorite foods when I was interviewing with Nickelodeon. Oh. And that was all possible because every page, you know, there were a few at the end that were from other projects that I did, but almost every page in my portfolio was just that one story. So I really knew who these characters were and talking about them and knowing who they were and then being able to explain that I designed them based on who they are, mm-hmm. right? Like their design reflects their personalities inside and their story. Uh, that like got me a lot of points, so to speak, in the grueling interview process. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, to your point, Abigail and Shannon, Alyssa, I, w- I would think that like, as an art director or a director that's looking at your portfolios, the biggest advantage that you can have is like a designer that looks at these projects in a project-based um, mentality. So like, you know, when anyone gets into the industry, um, you're going to be working, you're gonna come in and you're gonna work on this project, right? And then every single design element, every single design choice is going to be based on that story and that project. And then two to three years, you're gonna jump onto another project and then another project, another project. But like, if you can kind of think in terms of like, every design decision that you're making is based off of like this specific project that you have or you're assigned to, I think it's, um, I think it's beneficial, beneficial um, in the eyes of anyone who's looking at it. Uh, it versus, versus just kind of like, um, like, random illustrations that might be great, but thinking of it like on a project basis, I think is um, beneficial. What do you, what do you think, uh, Shannon or Alyssa? Oh, I think it's great. I, uh, I actually did something similar cause I, um, I really love mythology too. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm Irish and I uh, grew up in like a very Irish and British household. Um, But I ended up taking some Celtic myths and there's a handful of things in my portfolio that I kind of did a similar thing with where like I went and did some research and um, there's so many fantastical stories that are so uh, vague, especially because like a lot of it's passed down like orally. There's a lot of um, gray areas or things that are different between different iterations. So it's really fun to kind of take it and play with it. And uh, that it even does like so much of the work for you that it really allows you to just take your creativity and run with it. Um, so yeah, I just think it's awesome. And I'm really glad you brought it up, Abigail, because that was like a huge, a huge part of it for me. Yeah, for me, actually, I <laughs> I feel like I, it's kind of weird because I feel like when I graduated, I just like didn't think I was good enough in any sort of capacity to like even like make something that at least to me at the time like doing a huge project like it's like focus on one thing seemed like really really complicated and I was like I don't even know how to like draw very well (laughs) how am I supposed to even do this so I kind of even though I think that's a great idea and definitely probably highly recommended because it's like what all of you guys said I pretty much just tried to focus on just like really small things. Like I was like, okay, I don't know how to do background design. I'm just going to try drawing a background and see if I can do it. Cause I was at the time, I was just trying to convince myself that I could draw or that I, I did know how to draw. And so, but because I had been so afraid, like in school with tackling different things and feeling like I was qualified, like I kind of didn't, I just wanted to prove to myself that I did know how to do prop design or I did know how to do background design. So I just like took really small steps instead of like comparing myself to like the people that were getting the jobs that I wanted, I was comparing myself to like interns because I was like, I don't think I'm as good as like, I don't know, as Bobby or something like who's been doing this for many years. But like, I was just starting out. So I was like, okay, I'm going to look at an intern and see what they're doing. And if I I feel like I can 
relate to their skill level or I'm at the same level as they are, then I can apply that and like continue to just like push myself forward instead of like looking at like, you know, Kim Jong-gi and being like, I will never be Kim Jong-gi. Because <laughs> I think a lot of students come out of school and they just don't, a lot of people I feel like don't really know what their skill set is or what their strength is. And they're, and then you hear like, oh, look at professional portfolios. And then you look at a professional and they're like miles ahead of you because they've been doing this for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I think starting like small and looking at people that are like, either, even like just other students that you feel like are at a better level than you or higher than you or something that you feel like you can achieve. Like just taking a small step is bigger than what, is, I feel like it's better or like more efficient, at least for me, when it, in terms of, like, if I just want to start, because the, the biggest thing when it comes to applying for like a portfolio or anything is just starting. And I think a lot of people struggle with taking just the first step in a direction. So like, if you can start really small to, in, in like, in knowing what you want in a portfolio, or just like taking a step and doing something you're scared of, I think it goes a really long way into getting to a position where maybe you can focus on a larger project. Because for me at the time, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know how to even do that. So just take a small step. And whatever that small step is, it's better than no step or being afraid of taking like a large step. That's helpful. Cool. I don't know if I answered the question. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that all of you said what you said. And Shannon, especially, I'm so glad that you just said that because it's true. And I hear this from a lot of people when they're applying for trainee programs, as well as for internships, that they're afraid that their work isn't good enough for the trainee program or the internship. And it's because they're looking at professionals who've been working for 20 years and thinking, my work is not as good as this person. And But in our minds, for the people that are reviewing the portfolios or interviewing the candidates, we're not expecting you to be at that level that's why it's a trainee program. That's why it's an internship. We're not comparing you to a 20 year veteran. We're comparing you to other interns and other trainees who for the most part are all pretty, pretty much here. They're pretty much yeah. at the same level. You know, occasionally you get somebody where you just look at them and go, wow. Oh, okay. Well, you're like way off here, magical unicorn person, but most people aren't, aren't that way. And that's why these programs exist. And for those unicorn people, it's not to get on their case because Hey, good on you. But we're not comparing you to the professionals. That's part of the reason for, that's a big reason for these programs is clearly they have the skill to get to that point. They just need mentorship and training to refine, you know, the kernel of what's already here. And it's more of just looking at it of, can we work with them to help them achieve that goal? Are they on that path through what they've currently been doing. So I'm really glad that you mentioned the, rather than trying to create the world's best background portfolio, can I create a background that is sufficient for this? And the other part too is applying for these programs is free. So, so you're, not, you're not losing anything. It's not like you have to pay like $50, you know, to like enter into some kind of contest. So, so yes, please apply. Yeah, like one of my, um, one of the other trainees in the program that got the position, her name's India. She, I literally looked at her portfolio to figure out how to apply to the trainee program. And then she was my competition for getting into the program. Luckily, we both got it, which was really awesome because she's awesome. <laughs> but it's like literally anyone around you, like even if they're not like a, a professional yet, like, but you feel like their work is inspiring or like you like their work and you, you like what they're doing, like you can learn from that and take from that. So, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people on Instagram too. Um, I, I, in spite of being a creative my whole life, I'm also a very like type A organized brain type math person a lot of the time. So um, I even setting up my portfolio, like with the mythology thing I was just talking about, I um, get overwhelmed in a swath of projects. So I made spreadsheets for everything. <laughs> I kind of had like a plan of like, okay, I want about this ballpark of props and backgrounds. But another thing I did to find examples was um, you can go on IMDb and you can look up your favorite movies or TV shows and see who was a designer in that. And you can look up like anything they were in their portfolios normally. You can go on Instagram, find your favorite artist. They normally have like a link tree or something that has their portfolio linked. And 
And like, you can't see the NDA stuff, but there's normally like a ton of stuff that you can see and get an idea of like, oh, this is how they lay out their pages, or this is the kind of thing that got them hired for this kind of show. I want to do this kind of show. And like all that information, if you just like do enough Google search and dig in, it helps a ton. And then you just yep. copy it without totally copying it. You know what I mean? Like don't steal, but like layouts and stuff, that's super helpful. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, helpful. it helps to kind of set the bar for yourself. Like look at people, just Google people who have done or are doing what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And you have to tell yourself, okay, this is like the minimum level that I have to be at because this is what my competition is going to be like. So in doing that, just, um, yeah, I got like put together, like I put together a folder of just like a ton of different like work samples and things. And uh, just to look at what, what are they doing in terms of like how much detail are they applying? What, how, like, what about the lighting and the rendering and their paintings and things like that? You certainly don't have to and shouldn't copy anyone's work, but just gather these references so that you understand what's out there, what other people are doing. And also so that you can be original too, because you don't want to um, do something that maybe has been done before or is too similar Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i would like to clarify don't copy work i'm mostly (laughs) talking about look how people do character turns because a lot of people just like don't include that and it's like you know look how this person lays out a character and like that's the same in every portfolio or prop turns that was one of the things that got me my position was that i didn't know what a prop turn really was and then i included two pages with prop turns and um it was even in 2d and i got hired for a 3d show which is super rare but it was because they said like oh we can tell you know how to think about form you understand the fundamentals and you understand like the kind of work that'd be needed for a production and not just drawing like pictures that look nice Mm -hmm. um that's the kind of thing when i say like layouts it needs to look like production work and not just illustrations sorry i just want to make sure that's no, and that's, no. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair thing to bring up, Alyssa, too, because mm-hmm. like, um, like that's essentially what you will be doing when you get the job, right? Like exactly. it's not like creating your own personal illustrations, right? It's like, it's um, artwork that will help the production get made. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think a lot, we don't talk about that a ton because it's not super sexy, but like, I think like when you're brought on as an artist, I think that's, paramount right of just kind of like especially in on uh, uh bounty hunter it's like a 3d show right so like you mm-hmm. have to you have to think about that kind of stuff and yeah so. uh, that's very true especially turns because that's the thing like you don't see a lot of turns on instagram because they're not necessarily like a really fun I, thing to do but that's <laughs> i had pretty much yeah. what you're doing in television yeah. especially is yeah you're drawing turns it, yeah. expression sheets because that's what they're sending to the animation department yes so yeah. that the show can get made so if every shot is just three-quarter profile of a pretty girl with a bag and a hat it's like <laughs> there's not much they can do with that <laughs> yeah. um, I, I will say to, to your point angela like um we had an intern review with um eps on tangle the series Mm-hmm. And they the the creators kind of came in they looked over everyone's work and uh the creators were like i mean like i i love seeing the designs in the portfolio but like if they can show me like a clear turnaround it's mm-hmm. like gold <laughs> it's gold and i'm like oh i never i mean like that's essentially like in tv anyway that's a lot of what you're going to be doing and there's a beauty to that the turnaround that kind of stuff but like like, yeah, Chris Sonnenberg was like, if I can see a great turnaround, then that's going to just instantly, like, put you forward, you know, be on mm-hmm. the not the, the Instagram, like, sexy stuff, um, just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of, like, how to turn a character and that technical drawing, that kind of stuff. So. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. The technical parts that it's like broccoli, uh, you know, it's like maybe yeah, yeah. I, I like broccoli, but not everyone likes broccoli, but that's what you're, you're mainly doing the broccoli. So 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's get into then the actual interview mm-hmm. process because this causes a lot of anxiety and stress for people. Just the idea of I'm going to be in a room with these people that have my future in my hands or they're my heroes. Yeah. I'm in the room with my heroes and they're interviewing me. So how did you prepare for your interviews and what was that process like? Um, I think this was a weird experience for me because I don't have uh, a huge art background pre traineeship. Uh, I didn't go to art school or anything either. I was actually a music student. <laughs> so I had never um, even heard of or could really ask anybody like what an art interview was like. I had only done like retail interviews <laughs> up until that point. Um, so I prepared for it as much as I could in the same. Um, I dressed up nice. I like Googled typical um, interview questions because at that point, I think a lot of what they're doing, like not a hundred percent, but a lot of it's also like personality checks, right? Like, are you somebody we want to bring onto the crew? Are you like a reliable person? How do you respond to certain situations? And so I, I, I was like, oh, I could imagine like some of those questions would be the same. And then I, I did try to Google like, or interview questions and that didn't really work but like I don't know I still tried and uh and then when I got to the interview I was super nervous because my two mentors um it was uh Yuki Demers Mm. and Alex Konstad and I knew them both from I followed them for years on Instagram since like learning what the animation industry was and when I saw that they were interviewing me I freaked out like royally freaked out at the time and, uh, and it ended up being a conversation. They didn't ask me like a single question. It was just very like chatting to meet each other, which also makes sense because they're just trying to see if I'm like a good fit for them as like a mentee, right? And so like that could happen too. I'm still super glad I prepared the questions and I recommend people doing that. But also you just never know if sometimes it might just turn into like a, a chat. A chat. So that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely um the nickelodeon artist program has a very extensive interview process oh there's like uh there's like a phone call interview and then there's a video call interview and then there's an in-person like two-day six meeting interview uh thing which is very intensive (laughs) but um it how i prepared for it i did have some questions that i got from like student resources back when i was in college that I was using. And then I just like went over them with a friend. Um, I did have some fun hiccups in the interview oh, <laughs> process. Oh. So even if you screw up, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but, um, I I... <laughs> yes, yes. So in the video we're interview here. process, um, they asked me to tell, to, to tell them about myself. And I was like, oh, okay, I went to school. That, that was kind of all I said. <laughs> she said I went to school. And she was like, I went to school. I am an educated <laughs> woman. <laughs> I just didn't know. I don't know. I wasn't that prepared, I guess. But um, I, this is where I recommend having like some sort of pitch of yourself, like 30 seconds. Like she was like, that's it. You don't have any like siblings or something. And I was like, oh, I have a sister and a brother. It was so embarrassing. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, having some basic, like just who are you? What do you, what do you like? You know, I was like, oh, like in my more recent interview for like actual job, I was like, oh, I have cats. And in my free time, I'm working on a project with friends and they're like, oh, cool. And then they'd ask me about my project. So I think just like, if you're just talking to someone normally, like, what would you say if you're having like a 30 second pitch of yourself? Um, But that was really helpful, at least in the Nick Artist Program thing, because she would always ask every single one of like my what, 10 interviews, like, so tell us about yourself. And I was like, uh, definitely don't <laughs> just, didn't just go to school. I, I have a life other than school. But, um, so there was that. And then also in my first video or not video, my first in-person, um, one out of the six, I cried. <laughs> in the interview? I cried in the oh, interview. No. What happened? You made it though. I, you did, I did it. it. Wow. I know, crazy. You did it. I cried. <laughs> This, this is that a good cry or a bad cry? I mean, it wasn't a bad cry. It was just like a, like, I was like reminiscing on like memories kind of cry. Um, oh. So like, she was asking me like how I felt in school and I was talking about how I felt really insecure. And there was like people that like made me feel 
like bad basically and then she was like oh tell me about that and like she, oh no <laughs> and so I just broke down luckily it was like a room full of like women and they were all like really nice to me and it was fine and they comforted me afterwards <laughs> but <laughs> you could cry and still get a job so yeah anything can happen <laughs> anything can happen it's great but I was very very nervous like my the person that was in charge kept pulling me aside and was like you are extremely nervous just calm down and I was like okay I'm doing my best and I think I do a good job and she'd be like you are still very very nervous I think you need to calm down and I was like oh gosh I'm doing so bad but yeah that was a fun time (laughs) and it's over now (laughs) well just goes to show just be yourself Oh yeah, being your, being that your is, true that authentic is self. Honestly, it's being true. your authentic self. There was definitely a question that was like, okay, if there's one thing that you want us to take away from this interview, like what would it be? And it was like, well, first and foremost, like I care about people. I want people to feel good. I want people to feel like like they're that they can live and their job isn't their life and that like they have support. And so it was just like really about being my most authentic self. And obviously you don't have to be so authentic that you literally cry. That's like too much. But <laughs> just being yourself is like, and like having something prepared. Like if you know art, like, and you know, like what you like, like pretty much what Alyssa said, you're having a conversation. And obviously, even though some of these are like different processes and different programs, um, it's for the most part having a conversation. Mm. So yeah, Mm -hmm. if I can do it, y'all can do it, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I agree with the, be yourself for sure they want to see you they want to see who they who you are who they're going to be working with if they hire you uh my interview experience is one of my core memories now like an inside out you know like it's just it's always going to be there because it was so um intense and surreal uh and cool and terrifying and amazing it was you know it was just like this roller coaster of a week um i that was in 2018 so everything was in person i had to fly out to burbank and i stayed there because i don't remember if it was i think it was three days i think it was like a whole i think it was a three-day um ordeal and uh it was me and the two other finalists and they were only going to choose one person that year they only chose one person for the design track uh, that was me and then they chose one person for storyboarding track and that was Jake Kim and so I'm sitting out there with the other two my my competition you know but they were amazing artists I thought any of us could get chosen and we were just trying to chat casually and you know we were we would be, we'd be in this like waiting hall while one of us went into the room and then came back and then another of us would go into the room and such and such and this went on I think there were like two interviews every day and each interview was a panel interview so I walked in and there was a long table and there were like six to ten people in there and they were all like art directors they were character designers they were layout artists like they were you know like like these Nickelodeon Mm -hmm. people and uh what I the way I approached the interview was you know, in, in, in college, I had gotten used to kind of presenting my work to the class, uh, whether that's to the instructor or sometimes I would make an appointment with my department director and I would take my portfolio into his office and go through it with him. Uh, or there was, I also had this opportunity to take a class. Um, this was at Academy of Art in San Francisco, where you pretty much practice how to pitch a story, how Mm -hmm. to pitch an idea. And since my portfolio was based on a story, that's pretty much what I did. Like I sat down and at first they gave me like a couple of minutes to just go through my portfolio before they started asking me questions. So I... Um, That's what I did. I was like, this is the story of this girl. She goes to summer camp and then, you know, and I just kind of went through and I felt like I had to go through really fast because my portfolio had, I think, 18 or 20 pages. Maybe it was more than that. Uh, And then they would ask me the questions and the questions, I felt like I was prepared for them because they were the kinds of questions that I had been used to answering as a student. Mm -hmm. 
there was things like well, tell me about your design process mm -hmm. tell me your like what yeah what, what, what were you thinking like when you drew this or why did you make this design decision why is this character shaped this way um what inspired you and then I get to talk about how when I was little I went to camp with my school and it was this amazing experience that just another core memory <laughs> and that just always stuck with me and it was also it was really really cool I love being in nature but it was also really scary at night because you hear all these weird sounds so that was inspired the story and they really want to hear your perspective and what where you're coming from what is motivating you I think the only question I tripped up on was uh <laughs> one of one of the people on the panel who later ended up being my mentor so it's really funny uh, but she asked me so do you want to be a character designer or do you want to because prop designer because I can't really like tell right now and I was just like uh, 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 that was a char character I think I want to be a character designer like I got really nervous and she's like okay because in tv animation you have to choose one <laughs> And now, and, and like, she definitely didn't mean it to be like a scary question, but um, that made me nervous. And after I walked out, I was just like, oh, no, I think I messed. I think I messed that up, you know, because I, I, I was doing well, and then I stuttered and I suddenly didn't know what to answer. Um, but I think that was like the only one. I mean, I was really nervous in all of them. I was definitely like shaking, but I was also trying to be excited, really excited to be there at Nickelodeon. Um, instead, like rather than or trying not to show them that I was nervous, I was like, I'm so just so thrilled to be here today. Like, you know, like I'm at this studio that made all my childhood. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, so, you know, huge smile. Um, I was really enthusiastic about sharing my work with them. Oh, I just remembered because I also ended up um, interviewing people for the Nick Artist Program the year after. Um, and I feel like what I took away from that is that I think the more specific you are, like I think a lot of people, like when you get asked a question like, oh, what show would you want to work on? And then the person's like, oh, any show. It's kind of like, well, like even though, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm sure if I was in that position, technically I would want to work on any show. Like I just want a job, man. Mm -hmm. But like, picking something specific shows that you have done the research or put in the time. And so like having like a specific response or specific answer to like, you know, like, like if, if someone says like, who's your favorite artist? And then they're like, Oh, I like all the artists at Nickelodeon. You're kind of like, um, okay. Like that's not really, we want to know who you are. And if you're like kind of just trying to cater everything to what you think we want to hear, um, you're probably not going to be right. So I would just say like, once again, coming back to being authentic, being specific really makes a big difference um, in the interview process. Love it. All 706 of us. <laughs> you like all of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which might be, looks, like you said, that may be true, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> good, good to know. Like, like when they asked you, Abigail, like characters or with you, Alyssa, props or with you, no background. It's like your specific thing, the specific artist, the specific shows. Mm -hmm. You can have more than one, but you're right. Yeah. That does help. And not just for training program, that just helps for jobs, yeah. just in general. Because it's like you're being cast as an actor on a television show. And it's like, I can do everything. It's like, well, that's great. But what we need to hire this. Mm -hmm. are, are you this? Because if you are, then we know where to place you. If we don't know, then we're like, uh, maybe they're a good fit. But we have no clue. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I got my position on, on dad was like, I was doing... I had started doing like 3D stuff and then I actually had a portfolio review at Lightbox like this time last year and uh, they were like, yeah, I can't really tell if you're wanting to do 2D or 3D, like maybe you should pick one. So I started steering hard in the 2D direction because I just know there's a lot more movement and there's typically more entry level jobs and like trainee opportunities. Intern like I was like, okay, there's more opportunity here for the position I'm in. Let's go that way. And then... Uh, I kept both of those in my portfolio because there were a lot of good pieces in both that I had. And I was like, okay, I'll just do this until I whittle down 3D stuff, maybe put that in a separate thing. But like, I'll keep like chiseling away at it. But it was that stuff 
that got me the dad job because of the variety, which ended up being a blessing in disguise because that's my long-term goal, right? Is to work visual development, to do more like environment work. And even though it was called prop design, it was like, well, here, you're going to do that and probably other stuff. But it was because of like, I had a passion for it. I still pursued it. You know, like that, that opportunity opened up. There are other trainees at Netflix that were hired for that prop design position that really do like just straight up 2D prop designs. And that's what they wanted to do. That's what their portfolio showed. So in that case too, like what I had done in showing my passion in those other fields, like opened up that opportunity for me. And I think that happens to artists all the time. So definitely like stick with what you want to do, showcase what you want to do. Yeah. Definitely. And if you don't know what you want to do, just keep trying stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's no harm in just like continuing to explore. Because yeah. I got that same advice at Lightbox. I was like, well, you need to pick something. And I was like, uh, I really don't want to because yeah. I'm worried about putting myself into a bubble or like, what if yes. I pick something and I don't know what I like? Like, that's just, and I, and I get in a horrible job and I hate it. Like, it's like, well, when actually once you're in the industry, it's a lot easier to jump around. Like, Mm -hmm. like kind of like what Bobby was doing. He was like asking people like, Hey, look at my portfolio or can I try this or do that? Like there's a lot of people want to help you get there. Um, so once you get it, like, if you want to, you can focus on something if you really like that thing and get in. And most of the time when people are telling you to pick something they're saying, because like getting into a training position that has like a variety of things to do is much harder than getting like a normal, like prop design job, which seems like crazy. But um, usually because everyone's gunning for a training position because they think mm-hmm. it's entry level, um, there's like a lot more competition than like a standard job. So I, th- I think that I just got lucky like getting into this position because I did have like a really random broad portfolio that if I were to apply to like a background design position, it would have been like, what? Like, why would you apply to a background design position? You have nothing in your portfolio. You have like one background. Um, so really just like, do whatever you want to do technically, but just like put your heart into it, you know, like do like put in the time and the effort and like know how to crit- critically look at your work and like slowly build it up. Um, and whatever, if that means focusing on one thing or focusing on everything, cause you just don't know, that's totally fine. It's just about little steps. So. I'm glad you mentioned that Shannon, cause that's something we talked about last week in the story trainee panel about getting into training panels versus getting, you know, full-time work or contract work, it can be harder to get into a training program. And we don't say that to discourage people because everybody out there should absolutely apply for training programs because they're wonderful and they're a really good way to learn and get into the industry. But like you mentioned, one of the other reasons training programs are so hard to get into is because they're looking for very specific things. And it's not that full-time jobs aren't looking for specific things, but a lot of times in training programs, sometimes you have to have a a wider breadth of skills or you have to really demonstrate a really specific type of show or specific number of items. And like Abigail mentioned, sometimes there's a panel of people that you're interviewing with. Whereas, give an example, if you're applying for a storyboard position, you do a test and then you interview with maybe one to three people total. And then that's it. Whereas for a trainee program, maybe you're interviewing with like 12 people. So there's just different things involved. So we say all that just to let people know if you get into training programs, great. If you don't get in, that doesn't mean your art is bad. It doesn't mean that you are bad. It just means keep trying and keep applying for various things. And actually, Alyssa, I wanted to ask you something too. It's a little little sidebar, but I'm very interested sure. in this. So, so you went to school for music, which I is did. fantastic and awesome. So, to my knowledge, and Bob, Bobby, you, Bobby, did you go to art school or did you take art courses later? Remind me of your. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I went to like a two-year small like uh, art school and then took a ton of courses after that, though. Okay. Okay. So, so this is something I want to ask you, Alyssa, because we get this a lot too, of people that they didn't go to a two-year school or four-year school or an online school. So how did you educate yourself to put yourself in the position so that you could get your portfolio to where it needed to be in order to get hired? 
Oh man, I feel like I could, I could have like a podcast on this <laughs> kind of topic. Um, I'll keep it short though, but concise. Um, so I, I have my degree in music education and French horn performance. So before I switched to like the animation industry, I actually freelanced in orchestras and taught lessons. Um, so I did just a whole bunch of classical music stuff and through that, like conservatory training, um, it takes a lot of the same skills to do that as it does to be an artist. And I think that was a huge leg up for me, but the cool thing is there's skills that anyone can develop anywhere. It's just school does it in a very like focused and structured way. And what I mean by skills, it's like the ability to work on a craft long-term and not necessarily see progress day to day or even in a week, but like knowing kind of how to keep at it and how to break down something huge and massive. And that seems so far from you and then knowing how to break it down and scaffold it. So you know how to take like one step at a time to kind of climb the ladder. What I mean by that is two, three years ago, looking at any painting seemed like a magic trick to me, like did not, <laughs> didn't understand any art fundamentals whatsoever. I used to draw a lot when I was a kid, um, but I, I never once took even a class in like public school or anything. It was all just like, I like anime and wow, this looks cool. I'm going to copy my Pokemon cards and <laughs> learn how to draw creatures. <laughs> um, so like that, that was what I did when I decided to take art seriously. Uh, maybe two or three years after school, when I realized like a music career wasn't what I wanted, I, um, I decided like I would look up online. I looked up what like schools like Cal Arts and Ringling, what they were doing. Cause you can look up actually their like syllab, not syllabi. I think you can look up some syllabi online, but you can actually look up like what classes do the freshmen take? What classes do the sophomores take and juniors and so on and which programs. So I looked up like, okay, if I wanted to major in animation or illustration, you know, whatever corresponded the best with biz dev, what do they learn in what order? And I, again, I used a spreadsheet. I made a whole thing for it. It's still in my computer, but I, I organized like, okay, if I were going to school for this, this is how I would learn. So let's try to find YouTube videos on, okay, they're learning in this class um, form and like how to draw that or how to sculpt it. Okay, I'm gonna try to figure that out. I ended up using YouTube and then I did one of those like $200 schoolism subscriptions where I then took the classes there and like, you know, plugged them into that corresponding like classwork that they would have done at those schools. So um, I learned a lot of fundamentals that way. I cannot stress enough learning fundamentals because it's the same in music. Like you have to know form, you have to know values. You have to know edges. Edge control is huge. That was like my big breakthrough of like, oh my God, I know what an edge means now. Like it was, it was massive to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just a lot of good free information out there too. If you don't want to do schoolism, um, if you do want to do that though, it was great. Huge breakthrough. YouTube has a ton of stuff and you can just look up artists' names and a lot of them have just like tutorials, speed paints too. You can slow those down. I legit slowed those down. And I would watch people's painting techniques at like 0.25 speed. And that is how I learned how to paint. I'm not even kidding. It's awesome. It works. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a long journey. It was a lot of like using my teacher skills and like musician skills and like trying to apply that to what learning art would be like and and just you know going through classes and practicing lots of practice well, i mean it it sounds like you were just creative about your res what resources were out there and what um how you would plug that into sort of like a high-end cal artsy you know education but all that stuff's out there now right so you can yes. take advantage of that yeah yeah absolutely i i cannot stress enough what a huge uh help youtube is <laughs> for so many things. Also more information, like, like even what we're talking about, it's practical information and also stuff about the industry too. Um, it made me feel a lot more prepared walking into a traineeship, having not had like art student friends of mine, you know, like I, I didn't talk to anyone about the industry before I got all that information from YouTube and Instagram as well. I love what you said to uh, Alyssa about the fundamentals. I mean, like I, you know, beyond what we're talking about, like of, you know, sharing your voice and your own creativity, 
I would say for any of this stuff, especially as a character designer, the most important thing is like your draftsmanship. Um, because you're going to be working on a lot of different shows, you, if you have a solid sense of draftsmanship, it will enable you to jump from show to show to show. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's really important. It's not, yeah, I mean, like it's, you know, like kind of, <laughs> you know how it is. Like, like that you, Friday night, you're doing that boring work of studying anatomy, drawing muscles and all that kind of stuff. I mean, all that stuff is like, I uh, can be like meticulous, but it'll help you in the long run for sure. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's still things in um, in my traineeship and, and on the job now that I realize, like, because uh, I'm sure you guys have experiences too, you know, when you're like working on something and there's kind of like a natural flow to the process and then sometimes I'll get stuck and it's like, oh, well, what do I do? And of course, my like math brain starts to kind of kick in and refers back to like processes. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to those fundamental courses that or like, you know, the things I had set up where it talks about like proportion, value, edges, color, like, and, and it nor normally fits in, in one of those four categories for me, especially value is normally the thing that I'm like, I have to check my values. And then almost <laughs> always it fixes it. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I cannot stress enough how important. I mean, I can't draw hands like half of the time that I'm working <laughs> on this. Like, like I just, how does that? Thumbs on the wrong side. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon was gonna say something. Oh, I was. Uh, <laughs> what was I gonna say? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't draw. So I still I'm talking about thumb because I'm like I've done that. Yeah. I've done that. Things that I presented to people. Yeah, I'm like, oh, oh yeah. I'm a professional. <laughs> times, like I, I finished the character design. I was like, wait a minute, that thumb is on the wrong side of the hand. Yeah, constantly and, checking. <laughs> why, am I, why am I getting paid to do this? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of things too in music that uh because like in music like I've I've taken a fair amount of auditions which I think helped prepare me for like the art process too as far as like applying for jobs and what this like gig industry is like um but something that I learned in my bachelor's degree that I'll never forget is that everyone's just faking it until they make it in the arts and I feel like that's true in this industry as well everyone's just like doing their best like oh my god I won that audition yeah, I'll play the part. Cool. I'll do this. Said <laughs> like everyone's just like, okay, I'm gonna show up and do my best. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and it's just yeah, that's what it is. That yeah, is so I don't true. think anyone's like gone into a role being like, yeah, I am absolutely <laughs> prepared and ready for this. It's always yeah. like, oh, I got, I got the role I wanted, but it's only a matter of time before I mess something up. <laughs> like everybody I've spoken to feels that way. So yeah, we're all all of us in this industry are just doing our best and to the outside world it probably looks fantastic but like nobody everybody thinks that um uh, i think i guess imposter syndrome is the word that i'm looking for it's a it's big it is big and i've met people that don't have that and then that's kind of suspect to me because I've, I've met a few people <laughs> who are like i'm awesome and then it doesn't go well i'm like oh so, so there's definitely a balance of yeah. You know, going from I'm just a bundle of, of anxiety in a meat suit versus I am the best that's ever been. It's like you kind of want to be like maybe in the middle, yeah. you know, <laughs> just in the, in the middle, humble, working hard. That's probably a, a better way to place to be. I think yeah. part of it stems from the fact that as artists, we are constantly learning. We never stop improving. We never stop learning. It's a lifelong career. So you're always kind of picturing how you can be better and you'll continue to grow. So since we're never, we never reach a point of professionalism where we're satisfied, that's probably why as well. That's true. I don't know anyone's like, well, I am now the best that's ever been. I have reached the mountaintop of art. I shall learn no more. It's like, I don't think everyone's ever said that. I think a lot of what overcoming, I think, I don't think many people like imposter syndrome is such a it's such an overwhelming feeling and like you can get really sucked into it a lot of times, but I think a lot of kind of overcoming it in moments that you're just really struggling is recognizing that you have value and the work that you're making is worth it. Even mistakes are worth it and that has value. And mm -hmm. like, rec like for me, what I do when I'm like, like, oh, I don't know why I'm here. How am I working on this project? I'm not that good. 
I like take little screenshots of like the nice things that people have said to me like, oh, Shannon, that's a really awesome background or, oh, you turned this in so fast. That's so great. Thank you. Like, just like super minimal stuff. I just like to take little screenshots of it and collect it. So when I'm like, oh, I suck. Why am I here? I can like look back on it and be like, oh, wait, I don't suck. I'm doing my job. And this is what the job is. The job is making mistakes. The job is learning. The job is like, you know, struggling. Um, and just for the most part, just re like reminding yourself that you have value and the work that you create does have value, no matter how much you're struggling with it, no matter where, what level it's at. Like people, if people have a problem or like people want to help, the people mostly want to help you. Like we all are here because we want you to succeed as well. You know, like we're not like, just like going to toss you aside. We want you to get in and like be successful. And so like, so the same thing happens with people on your team. They want you to succeed. They want to help you. So like, and they also think that you're worth it. Like I mm -hmm. would always call my production assistant friend and I'd be like, I suck. And she'd be like, oh my gosh, you're ridiculous. And <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was being ridiculous. And it's so easy to get so overwhelmed with feeling like you don't belong and you're not that good, but y'all are worth it. So just actually mistakes are something I think we should talk about because as a new, you know, for any newcomer, that's something that you're going to be terrified about when I graduated from college, for some reason, I had it in my head that I had to be perfect now that we like my, my, my first job I had to, I was a professional now. I wasn't a student anymore. I wasn't allowed to make mistakes. And if I make one mistake, I'm going to get fired. You know, like, I don't know why, like that was what I had in my head. Um, so I was really, really anxious at my first job and kind of realized actually like everybody makes a lot of mistakes every single day. I make mistakes really often. And, um, I still like, you know, sometimes my art director will just send something back to me being like, Hey, like, you know, like Bobby said, the thumb is on the wrong, <laughs> wrong side of here. And I just be like, Oh, whoops. You know, and just send it back. Like it is really not a big deal. Like it is when you're working on a production, um, what you create gets get it gets reviewed. It's kind of like being a student. You're present like when you're presenting your work for your instructor, uh, and they kind of do red lines on it, and then they kind of give it back with feedback so you can improve it. That's pretty much what it's like working on a production. You've got it, except now instead of a teacher, you've got an art director, you know, or, or, or someone who's leading your team and you show them your work, what you've done sometimes that same day, like you might send it in a message um, or maybe your team does something where once a week you all show your work and then feedback is given out. And you do a lot of revisions. I mean, a huge chunk of concept there is revisions. You're going to throw away so much work and so many designs that weren't right. Um, but that's how you get to the finished product, like the, the finished design or the illustration. It's a lot of revisions. It's a lot of your art director saying, mm, that's not right. I don't like that. Can you please punch up the values? Um, <laughs> right? Um, it, and that's what it's like every single day. It doesn't say, it doesn't mean that you're like not a good artist. This is what the creative process is like. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up too, Abigail, because that's something you don't see in the art of books. Like you don't see, like no one talks about it, like, oh yeah, um, this person showed this and I shot it down eight times. And this is <laughs> where they got down here. Yeah. No one talks about that stuff because, you know, why would you? Um, but it's the reality of it. And so it's like part of what you're talking about, Abigail, is like developing a thick skin and, mm -hmm. and just kind of taking it, taking those kind of feedback in stride of just kind of like, okay, this is going to kind of like make it better. And it's so funny too, because as, just, as a student, you're like, if I could just make my portfolio perfect or my demo real perfect, and then I get a job and this, I'll have to, I, I can coast. But like, like when you do get that job, it's like, it's it's that times a hundred, like uh, just like, you know, feedback and kind of like, um, uh, I just kind of like, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. You have to work on this, this, and this, and this. And, um, you know, like some days where like, 
oh, this is great. I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a battle hardened biz dev warrior. Other times it'll destroy you. And you're like, oh, I call you up your friend. Like you said, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's, it's the life of a artist. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all. It's also true because it, it actually, Abigail, you you made me think of something. This is so. Um, this was a huge hurdle for me to get over because I I think before getting into the traineeship, I think I thought being an artist of any kind, right, biz dev, prop, background, character, whatnot. I think I used to think that that role and art director were kind of like rolled into one a little bit. Like I didn't really know what an art director did. I thought like a hundred percent that pressure was on me. Like the review isn't for revisions. Like I need to come ready. A revision is like a failure. Like how could I, like, I, cause I had no idea, especially without like the art school scope. Mm-hmm. And then especially through the mentorship, like um, you get a huge opportunity to ask questions. Like, I think I, I met with my mentors, like personally one-on-one three days a week, sometimes more. And it was just for us to like chat do you have questions about your art or even just like the industry? Do you just want to like chill and have coffee? But it was like great opportunity for these kinds of conversations. And I learned that like, yeah, getting revisions is like, that's what the art director and production designer do is because like, that's their job is to make sure everything's running smoothly. and looks good. They're like the extra eyes because they are so experienced and they've done it so much. They don't expect you, especially in a traineeship to like be that, that level yet because it takes time and experience. Um, and, and it just didn't hit me until I was like in the trenches, like, oh, okay, that's a huge like weight off my back. Another thing too is it's really important to be, um, how do I say this? Like open and like vulnerable to an extent where like you should want to go and ask for help from these people, like your directors, because whether you're like a trainee or not, like I still, I still go to my like higher ups and leadership all the time and ask them for questions and help because uh, they want to still see you succeed, you know, and they, they're the people there that are going to help push you along. So like I, it's important to be open and don't be afraid of somebody saying something bad about your art or critiquing it because in the long run, that's going to help make you better. Yeah. And on the subject of getting help, that's so important too. Uh, there will be people on your team. Well, first of all, if you're working on at this studio or at this company, you've been hired because they know you can do the work. And no matter how many revisions, you know, it's like you're doing the best that you can. You are, you are providing professional quality work. Uh, so you know, it's not like you're slacking or anything. And that's, that's why you're making mistakes. Right. But sometimes you get stuck and there will be people on your team who are stronger in an area than you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe you're struggling with a vehicle and it's in perspective and that's like your least favorite thing to draw. Um, But there will be somebody on your team who loves like machines and that's their thing. And, you know, just peek, kind of peek over their cubicle and be like, hey, are you really busy right now? Or like, can I ask you something? Um, nine times out of 10, like they're super nice. Like, I mean, this happened to me recently. I was painting um, a candied apple for, uh, it was just an, an illustrative asset that, uh, that I needed to do for my assignment. And I couldn't get the specularity, right? Like the way that light, um, passes through the caramel on the candied apple and reflects off of it. Uh, but there was an artist on my team who paints really realistic. Like she just renders things in a really beautiful way. And I sent her a message and I asked her to take a look at my work and if she could give me any tips. And she, she did like a whole, like step-by-step, step, this is how I would do this, which was way more than I was expecting, but I just thought that was super cool. And then likewise, people have asked me for tips on, you know, within the same project being like, I'm drawing a cute bunny and cute animals aren't my thing. Can you like, like what advice do you have for me? So yeah, like help is totally fine. Totally fine. Ask for help. Use your teammates. Mm. Yes. If you don't want to creepy, scary animals, <laughs> ask, ask <laughs> other, other, other people for it. That is so true. And also once you start working too, 
you know, your directors and your art director, your story directors, art directors, they'll start to know what your strengths are as well. And then a lot of times on shows, they'll help you play to your strengths because we've had this on both shows that I've worked on where, like you said, Abigail, there's a person that's better at vehicles or better at cute animals. They'll assign those assets to that person because they'll know, well, this person is good at this and they like this. So we're going to give that to that person because they want, to, we know they want to do it. And mm-hmm. to this other person, we'll give them this because we know they want to do it. They're not sitting there going, well, they need to learn. So we're going to give them this truck. It's like, that's not really how it works. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. So once you start to get a little specialized, you know, you can, you can request certain things and they'll help you with different things as well. Cause that's, you know, it's a team. It's why you're on a team. It's a team sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let me ask you guys then. So we talked about application. You talked some too about what it was like working there, but like what, if you can, what specifically were they having you do in the programs? Like what was the day-to-day process for y'all while you were in the traineeships? So, okay. (laughs) So for me, I think it's the same for like the past, like what, I don't know how long the Nick Artist program has been going, but very long time now. Um, But basically you start out and you're just with like your teammates, whether that just be like one person or you're like the five other mentor mentees that I had. Um, And we all got together and made like an art book that was designed based off the theme. So we worked on that for about like two months, um, which was pretty fun and complicated um, because I'd never really done illustrations before. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but that's besides the point. Um, and then we also had like a Instagram, Facebook, like weekly post where we like created another little like project of like some sort of like theme. Mine was like food or something like that. I can't remember. Sorry. Um, and I would just do like a drawing and like talk about my experience or talk about how I was feeling. Um, and so everyone had just like a different theme and that was like for like, there was like 20 drawings in total for that. Um, and then we also did like meet and greets. So we would go around and we would talk to people uh, or we'd have these scheduled meetings with groups of like two to three people and we would ask them questions and they just like give us advice. Um, and we'd also talk, like I also talked to Abigail like about her experience on the Nick Artist Program. Um, so we talked to the previous mentees and then just other people around the studio. Um, and then depending on who your mentor is and like what your mentorship is really like. Like for me, I was just like thrown onto the show and yeah, wipe your hands clean. Um, But for other people, um, they could either have like more of like my other mentee had like um, just like different assignments. Like she went through all the different like background, a background test and a character test and a prop test. And like they talk more about like that experience. And I think for the most part, you can like cater what you want. Like if you want something as a mentee, you can just ask like, Hey, I want to do this thing. Um, and like it is a mentorship. So there's, there's a two way street. So you can like talk and ask for what you need or what you want to do, or, um, just get coffee, um, or whatever. Um, and then I think that was pretty much it. Like it really just depends on who your mentor is in a lot of cases. Cause they always like design it just for whatever, like their needs were. And we were put with like an art director or like a, a storyboard director, um, depending on what track you were on. So yeah, it was pretty much the experience. I could talk a little bit about the Netflix program because it sounds, it's kind of crazy how different it it sounds from the Nick program. And also um, my experience will be a little different because I did the whole thing during the work from home era. (laughs) which is like giving it a completely different spin now. Um, So the Netflix trainee program is, uh, this is at least how it was back then. I was on like the first batch of art trainees. It was me and one other person. We were the first design trainees. Um, They had done some story stuff before then, but uh, we were the first brought on for this. So it might be a little different, but as far as I know, it's still like mostly the same with minor tweaks. What they do is they look for shows within Netflix who want to take on a trainee and whenever they want to do that, they, you know, go through all the applications. Um, They go through like an interview process. There's a phone interview that I have with the engagement team, the engagement recruiters who are in charge of that application. 
And then if you get through that, then you go with the art directors and then the actual program itself, because you're like hired onto the show, um, as a trainee, like it's another thing too. It's like, it's a paid position and you're like working in it. Uh, it's technically like a four month contracted position that you're then hired for. And the way Netflix has it, uh, set up where I would have like meetings with the onboarding team or the, sorry, outreach and engagement program team. That's like the official name for that um, early career program of recruiters at Netflix. So I would have monthly meetings with them where we would check up on like, how are you doing? You know, what have you learned this month? There were like surveys and stuff I had to fill out that um, would then facilitate a meeting with them just to see like, hey, how are you doing? And it was also a time of like, are you feeling okay? Like if you need anything, always, you know, reach out. Um, You know, they were always just there to have my back, but we would definitely have those monthly check-ins. And then on top of that, the things I did with my mentors on my show with Yuki and Alex, and um, I also got to work with Kristen Garland a little bit. The three of them, we would all meet up like three times a week, sometimes a little more, and we would kind of do our own thing. But Netflix also had some like parameters on that. So the, the idea was month one was no production work. It was just getting used to the job and being like, hey, did you know you can read scripts and, you know, look at the pitch Bible and learn about the show before you do designs or like um, just basically like getting used to the job, making sure tech set up. But during that time, they also gave me like practice assignments. So we actually came up with my own like story world that they would then assign me things like props and environments, things that I would end up doing on the job and in the style of the show, but just like in the separate little bubble. And that was also so that I could then take those pieces and put them in my portfolio immediately and not have them be like NDA or anything. It's just like, oh, hey, you have this now. And then around month two, so I had some time to get my feet wet and get used to everything and sit in on art reviews and such. After that, um, month two began really light assignments. And they like had my back the whole way and just make sure like, oh, is everything good? Um, Month three and four ramped up more where by the end of month three, I would say it felt very much like I was a full-time artist in the show, um, but just had a couple of extra, you know, like meetings with the recruiters and uh, extra training check-ins with my mentors. And then at the very end, you have to give a presentation to all of Netflix and whoever shows up. Yeah, it was the time. You basically (laughs) make like a little PowerPoint thing and you're like... (laughs) hello, here's my training experience. I hope you enjoyed it. And so that was, oh that was the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, it's just that going, so hello, stressful. all of Netflix. <laughs> oh yeah, we were the same. It was, it was, it was a lot, but luckily it was virtual. So it, it felt like this, you know, it wasn't mm-hmm. too bad, but it, it was, it was nerve wracking. Um, but yeah, so then it just wrapped up with that. And it was a very slow incline of like working into production stuff and the whole point is to like embed you in the team and yeah I never once felt overwhelmed because of that system so that was great <laughs> that's awesome right on yeah um well I was also in the Nick artist program like Shannon so our experience is probably <laughs> <laughs> our experience was probably similar um you get put on a show a current show, which is really cool. I was on the Loud House and I got to see uh, Loud House too. I got to see, which is a really great team. Everybody's super nice. And you get to work under, in my case, I was working under the creative director mainly. And I was receiving assignments from the show. They were the same assignments that like the character designer was working on, that the background artist was working on. I was getting copies of that same assignment pretty much and practicing with it, doing it. Uh, And then it was really funny because sometimes I would design a character and then I would think it was like pretty, that it was decent. (laughs) And then I would see the actual character design um, for that same project and it was way better. But but that's why I was there. So uh, it was it was a great like simulation of what it's actually like to work at Nickelodeon plus the one on ones which were really cool which is like you meet you just sit down and you meet all of these people across the studio and we were encouraged to to also just walk up to people and pretty much you have a lot of like freedom and. Uh, 
you know, your behavior just kind of gets excused because <laughs> you're, you're like a trainee. So you can be a little bit annoying and just walk up to people and be like, Hey, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I want to ask you <laughs> questions. And honestly, I was always kind of anxious about doing that, especially if they were like, you know, someone that I viewed as like an authority figure. Um, but every time they were so nice and they were like, yeah, let's grab a coffee and sit down and I'll, you know, I'll answer all your questions. And then I would write them down in this notebook, um, which I still have. That's, it's a really cool, cool souvenir. Um, uh, yeah, that, that sounds amazing. I mean, I remember uh, just off the cuff, I mean, I had a friend that was a, a Nick Turn, Nick Turn, uh, like a few years ago. And she would always tell me like stories of like, you know, when she was walking down the halls and stuff like that. And then, and she was like, and then one time I turned the corner in the hall and I saw Mike and Brian from Avatar and I just like freaked out. And then I was like, back then I, I didn't know who they were there. I was like, who's Mike and Brian? She's like, they're creators of Avatar. And it's like, how were they? And she was like, they were so nice. They were so nice. <laughs> and Mike and Brian were like, you're, you're part of the new intern group, right? And then they took the time to talk to her and all that kind of stuff. And, she, and like, just that one might have been a five minute interaction, like stayed with her for the rest of her life. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just kind of mm -hmm. that, like, little, those little bits. I just kind of like how yeah. open uh, the kind of environment was or is, you know. And yeah, animation people are super, as a, like, as a whole, are very friendly. Mm -hmm. I love this industry because of the people. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, so it's, it's encouraged. You should you should talk to people. It's a, it's like we like answering people's questions, and we can we can pick out the interns and the trainees at least when we're in the office because y'all are the nicest dressed. Oh, all, all of us are all of us. Um, we've gotten settled. <laughs> y'all come in and you're your nice fresh face. It's like oh, it's the new people. Oh, this yeah. is lovely. Yeah. 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 Bright eyed and bushy tail. That's, That's so right. funny. I heard that too. I heard that too. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, Angela, what do you, when do you, yeah. do you want to ask a few more questions or should we get to Q&A? Yes, yeah, so let me ask, uh, let me ask this last one and then we want to get over to the Q&A because we have some really yeah. good Q&A questions here. So I would say, what do you wish that you knew then that you know now about being in the program that would have helped you either during the application process or while you were a trainee? Okay, I have a real answer and a, and a dumb one. <laughs> I want to hear them both. Whoa, a real great. answer and a dumb one? A real answer <laughs> and then a joke answer. This is great. Yeah, okay, the joke <laughs> answer, the joke answer is if you want to do anything in 3D, Blender's great. You should learn Blender because I'm trying to learn it now and you should just bite the bullet and learn Blender. <laughs> oh, that's not a joke answer. No, that's, that's, that's a valid. solid answer. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, learn, learn the okay, tools. The answer A, you should learn Blender because I I knew like bare bones Blender and and then I saw what some people on my team could do with Blender. And granted, these are people who have been like even like somebody even worked at like EA for a bit and then jumped to animation and they were like, oh yeah, I've been using this for years. But just... The amount of time they saved from using it just if, if you're kind of wanting to go in that field just do it bite the bullet learn it now it's better because i'm doing especially, it now especially as an environment prop artist yeah yes yeah or if you're wanting to do to like work in like a cg space um mm -hmm. or a cg film or show that that skill set will prove to help you <laughs> in some capacity absolutely um but yeah learn blender do it now the second thing I would say is um, emotionally, not to take things personally or read too much into things. And I, I think I experienced that kind of like throughout the application and even the traineeship. And, and even now, this is just good, I feel like industry advice. I remember seeing posts on Instagram about somebody getting like an interview for the trainee position and then getting it. And it was before my interview even happened. And my mind started running away from me and I felt really bad. Um, turns out it was the second person who got it on a different show. But for some reason, like my brain went straight to worst case scenario. Like, oh my God, they got it. And I didn't. Why are they bothering to interview me? Um, there's just a lot of 
things that go on behind the scenes in this industry that I, you don't know about. There's and still like, I mean, I say that like, like I know I still don't. Um, there are going to be times when you get hired and you work on a show where maybe um, you feel like you're not getting handed assignments. You feel like you like, or maybe um, you get a pain over back and you take it maybe a little personally and you're like, oh my God, did they not like the work I did? Or like, do they think I'm awful at my job because they you know, sent this critique back or like, why do I get more critiques than so-and-so or like, just don't, don't think of it like that ever. Nothing's ever personal. Everything in this industry moves so quickly that if a lot of times things that I think you infer don't exist, like it, there's so many things happening behind curtains that we just like, don't, don't know about because of how things work. And, um, everyone's just rooting for you. No one's like wanting to see you fail. So like, yeah, just, you know, do your best all the time and keep a smile and you'll be good. <laughs> I feel like my advice is on the same lines as hers. Like I totally did read into everything when my yes! director would sign an email with a smiley face. I was like, oh my gosh, she likes me. <laughs> I was like, please just like me. Or like if yes! she would write her full name or if she'd write her nickname, I was like, oh, she wrote her nickname this time. Maybe she's trying to be more friendly. Like I was like insane, I swear. But yeah, Absolutely. reading it, like people aren't really thinking that hard. I think when they're communicating, I try to always like add like a million exclamation points and smiley faces. Cause I'm like, I'm friendly, please like me. And I like you. Um, but yeah, reading into things is just like a lot of energy that does not need to be spent in that way. Um, and like, if you are like really concerned and like you're stuck in your head about like, so-and-so is doing this and I'm not doing that. Or so-and-so thinks this. And I, I don't think that like, just communicate, like, like people are happy to hear what you have to say like nine times out of 10. Um, so just communicate, especially if you're like a trainee or even if you're not a trainee, like just like just talk with your peers and like your director. I'm, I'm sure they're willing to listen um, and hear what you have to say if you're feeling like insecure or like your assignment's too overwhelming. Maybe you just need something a little bit like less on your plate. Like there's literally nothing wrong with just communicating that, hey, I'm overwhelmed or hey, can you add a smiley face at the end of your messages? <laughs> Maybe not that far, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but yeah. No, that's a great, great. Sorry, Abigail, go ahead. Oh, I was just say communicate oh, and Shannon. don't read into things. But yeah, that's all. <laughs> um, I last thing, uh, just building off that, like, um, to to your point, Shannon, of like, there. I mean, I know what it's like to be afraid to ask questions and all that kind of stuff because you don't want to look like that person that doesn't know what they're doing, right? But like as somebody um, on the other side of things, like anytime someone asks questions like that, even if they're, um, they're like, I I'm sorry, like I I've never done this before. Um, so like, what is this? Can you walk me through this? That's, that's more important. That's better than um, them not asking the question and then sort of like going into a blind fit of just not knowing what they're doing, right? I would rather, um, hear from someone that just kind of like asks like everything and you know what the thing is like it's not the people I, I think the reason why people don't ask questions too is like a they don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing b they don't want to take up a lot of time but i'm telling you like we have all the time in the world i mean like when, you know what i mean like i would rather sit down with somebody like a new person for like two hours and just kind of go over the stuff um, and there's no judgment on my part because I know what it's like to not know anything, right? Or just kind of like um, not know um, the ins and outs of the studio. But I would encourage, um, uh, you know, trainees or people kind of coming in of just kind of like, yes, please. I mean, like, please, let's talk about it. You know, let's give me every question that you have. And uh, honestly, it, you're, 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 I mean, I would, this is a great situation now because it's going to alleviate a lot of the you know, um, issues we might have down the road because we didn't know what we were talking about, right? So let's sit down and talk about it now. And, you know, like, like, like the panel said, I mean, animation is full of people that want to help out. Um, go ahead, Abigail. Uh, yeah, my advice would be, well, well, if there was anything I could do differently, I pushed myself a lot harder than was necessary because this was my, that was my, Nick Artist program was my first animation role. And that was kind of like a dream, dream role. So I just really, really, really wanted to do good. But 
a lot of stuff happened like that time period coincided with a very like a bad time for my health um so i was like going to doctor's appointments in the middle of like the work day and things like that so i ended up getting a little behind on some projects and i was taking them home and i was staying up all night doing them doing assignments that were for training purposes only that i shouldn't have been burning myself out on and that my creative director and the program manager would have absolutely understood if i had not been able to, to turn in, you know, this turnaround or whatever it was, which again, wasn't for the production. It was simulating the production, but it was for training purposes. Uh, I think a lot of us sacrifice health uh, for our career and it never works out well because your health gets worse. And your work also gets worse because you're not resting and you're not recovering because you have the stress of you not feeling well or having other stuff that's going on. In order to create quality work, you need to feel at a quality level, you know, and I, I just emphasize sleep so much. Um, as artists, we use our mind, you know, very, very in a very actively and concentrated way. And in order to be creative, you have to be well rested and eat. My gosh, like eat. There were there days where I skipped lunch. And again, like that, uh, the program wasn't making me do that. I was making me do that because I had it in my head that I had to, had to do this. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, if I could go back, like that's what I would do differently. For solid sure. advice. Really good advice. Yeah, solid yeah. advice. Would yes, would recommend. <laughs> yeah, it's something that I hear so many others talk about. We're bad at this. We're bad at resting. Mm -hmm. We're bad at taking care of our health. We're bad at taking care of our bones and stretching and eating right. And it's a it's a problem. So definitely like do what Abigail said. Like you you need to take you're not gonna be able to create if you're not taking care of yourself, you need to take care of yourself first. So thank you, Abigail, for sharing that, because that is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for sharing, actually, for all the things. So Bobby, who do we have up for questions? Dan, are you on the call? <gasps> yes, I am. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. 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 How are you? Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so I had a couple questions. Hi, there. Now you can see me. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Um, a couple of questions were if you were working remotely and how that was going. And the second question was, have you noticed that most of the trainees are recent grads or have you noticed trainees of all ages and different backgrounds? Like, what's that been like working with other trainees? Um, for me, it was like, right, the pandemic started while I was in the training program, which was a oh. super fun time. Oh. <laughs> um, it was definitely interesting. The transition um, was like kind of overwhelming because it's like you just started a job and you're trying to get used to the studio. And then it's like a couple, like you're only there for like just a handful of time. Like I just joined my production, like maybe like two or three weeks before the pandemic happened. Um, and then, uh, so it was mostly like overwhelming, but like, the production really, really wants you to be okay. <laughs> so they're like giving you resources or they're telling you to take time off or they're giving you the equipment that you need. And like, I didn't really have that much space in my little apartment. Like I kind of was just like in my room. Um, and it was definitely really, really difficult um, because A, I had just moved to California and I was by myself. I didn't really have any friends. And it was just like a very emotional time, but Luckily, we've been doing this for a little bit longer. Um, not to say that that's, it got necessarily any easier. It's just like different challenges are now like arising. Like I, as like a newer person in this industry, like how do I really make connections when like everyone's just like this, in this virtual space? Um, it feels really hard. <laughs> like I'm like, yes. uh, do you know me? Do I know you? I don't know. I just joined for a couple of meetings there and there. And it's hard to talk like 
Um, so it's definitely a difficult experience and it's really hard to say what this will look like after this potentially hopefully ends someday. Um, but um, that, like we're making it work and we're doing our best and um, like and overall, at least in my experience, the industry and the people in the projects that I've been have been super accommodating and super understanding. Um, and it's also nice to see like your other like teammates like just like be sad on Twitter and be like, oh, I hate working from home. Or maybe they love working from home. This is a great experience. This is a very large debate about <laughs> the yeah. benefits and <laughs> stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's been it's been a time. Was that the full question? I can't remember. I feel like you asked something else. Oh wait, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, the other question was just if you've noticed that other trainees are also recent grads or there's also older trainees from other backgrounds. Like I was wondering if it was a mix or leaning more one way or the other. Oh yeah, it's definitely a mix. Like I just was a recent grad at like 22 and then there was someone else that was like 32 as well. So it's, it's like a pretty big, they're not really looking or care that much about your age, at least in the Nick Artist program. Um, it's just sort of about like who you are and what you're bringing to the table and if they like you pretty much. Um, so yeah, any age, no matter what your experience is, totally fine. My experience with Netflix was completely virtual. So um, even the interviews were all done um, through Zoom and like Google Meets and such. So I've actually never met anyone on my crew or the recruiters or anybody in person. It's all virtual. And sometimes it feels like a dream, which stinks. But also at the same time, it's been amazing the kind of relationships we've still been able to cultivate. Like there are a lot of people on my crew who like, I didn't know at all before this started. Um, and now I feel like some of us are like really good friends. We're like, if I work on a production with them later and hopefully we're in person again, like I'll probably run up and give them a hug as if I did meet them in person because like we've still been able to do that. <laughs> um, it's definitely been a challenge because there have been times that um my mentor would even make comments like man if you know if we're getting coffee like I wish we could just be walking around the floor right now and I could introduce you to people like that's probably the the biggest drawback drawback and the only major drawback that there's been is like you can't I haven't been able to walk around and like get that experience but I mean I've still been able to reach out virtually through like emails or slack and ask people like hey you want to meet or our crew all the time did um Google Hangouts, like at the end of the day, just like, hey, at 3 p.m., y'all want to draw together while we finish up the work day? <laughs> we would just do stuff like that all the time. Um, so that hasn't been too huge. And I think because I came into, it was like a year into working from home. It was like a little less than a year into working from home. Uh, they kind of had a system down for like getting tech equipment to me and getting that set up remotely. Um, they didn't have me relocate to California right away because like, you know, she doesn't need to right now. We'll just do that when office is open. Um, and I greatly appreciated that because I, God, managing the, you know, the pandemic and moving across the country would have been a lot. So like that at least worked out for me personally. Um, but everything else they pretty much had a system for and the production had a great pipeline for working virtually and making that happen. So um, it's all been really smooth. And then as far as like trainee uh, ages and backgrounds go, I mean, you know, like I'm, I was a college graduate and was in a different career field before this. I'm 26. <laughs> I'm turning 27 in a couple months though. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I was kind of like middle of the boat too. There was somebody who was two years older than me. Um, and also like, we're both married. Like that was another weird demographic thing where like then all the postgraduate, like the 22 year olds who are in the program, you know, there were a couple people like that, a couple people like us. There's one person who was even older than um, me and the other girl. But when we told everybody like, yeah, we're married. And like, I even like, I actually own a house in Florida. They were like, you're a homeowner? What? <laughs> they were like, you seem so young for that. I was like, well, I mean, my a life rare very... breed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, also my life was very different two years ago. So like, it's, um, yeah. You can just always reinvent yourself somehow, right? <laughs> no. um, but yeah, my point being is there's a ton, ton of different backgrounds, ton of different people. Um, yeah, don't I, I don't think they really look for that. And if anything, probably the diversity in different backgrounds um, is something that excites them. I think they liked that my background included 
being a musician. So I say celebrate it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, working from home hasn't been bad at all. Um, if anything, it's just kind of disappointing to not be, you know, so since I'm working on a contract with Facebook right now, uh, their campus in Menlo Park has free food and it's just really cool. So it's, it's, you know, it's a shame that in March, you know, we went home for two weeks, never came back. So, uh, but day to day, um, it's, it's not bad at all. We have an interface that we use to upload all, all of our work and message each other and communication is pretty instant. Lots of video calls every day. Um, that's the biggest thing. It's like normally you'd be uh, just hanging around each other's desks and having like a, you know, like a little meeting or going into a little conference room or something. Uh, now everything is, is through video call. Um, but our work, our, our like um, output hasn't decreased. If anything, I think we've been more productive during this whole time period. We've put out and like a lot of work and released a lot of um, a lot of content. And yeah, as far as age, uh, I'm I'm 29, and I graduated in 2015. So yeah, you don't have to be a recent grad at all to mm-hmm. to do the the in, the intern or the Nick Artist program or training programs in general. Well, yeah, and, and as for Nick Artist program, I did that in person because that was in the pre-pandemic times. Well, thanks so much for answering, guys. That was really useful and helpful. It was really cool meeting you. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Not just on Instagram. I know, right? <laughs> Well, it's a pandemic life now, right? Like social meeting <laughs> over video. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks, Diana. Great question. Yeah, thanks. And then Patricia. Hello. Uh, it's Hi. it's Patricia. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Um, I'm from Croatia, and I uh, have. Oh. Sorry. Oh, oh, right, just... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh... Hi. Do you hear me? <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm from Croatia, and I learned about Nick Artist program like I think two or three years ago, and I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> and I'm interested. Like, can I apply if I'm from Europe, and how does it go? Like. I'm pretty sure you can't. I think, I feel like there has been people in the past that have been from out of country that have applied and gotten the position. I'm not 100% sure how that works because I'm from America. So, but I'm pretty sure you can. It, it, it tell, it'll tell you in like the description, like what is and isn't like available to be accepted at the time. So I think it can change from year to year. Like just this past year, they, you know, started the CG program. So things are always like updating and changing. So I just pay attention to like what's on their website. And, you know, also you can like reach out and ask questions through like the Instagram. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I just put it in the chat there for you, Patricia. So and forgive me if I pronounced your name wrong. So sorry about that. But yes, so definitely check out the website and check out the FAQ. And if it's not answered there, you can actually reach out to the folks directly. I believe they do have an email address there because off the top of my head, I don't know for sure if they're allowing international candidates, but maybe they are now, especially since everything is on Zoom. So that's definitely something to look into as well as with the Netflix program. So that's definitely a thing to check the websites and ask the program administrators about that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all changed, right? So that, that brings up like a question too. Like, do you, um, do you all think that like us being in quarantine and having worked in quarantine on these productions successfully, do you think that'll change the way that industry looks at whether it's freelancers or bringing on trainees or bringing on interns where they don't necessarily have to be in the LA area 
you know what I mean? Or do you think that sort of shifted a little bit with the advent of us working well on Zoom and, you know, mm -hmm. talent around the world and that kind of stuff? Or I, I'm interested to get your thoughts on that. I would hope like so. To change. Yeah, I like, hope so. I, mean, I feel like, oh, sorry, Abigail, you go, you go. <laughs> no, okay. Um, having to move to LA just to be in the union is really frustrating. Mm -hmm. Because, like I like I live in the Bay Area, you know, and um, it's pretty much been this back and forth, back and forth, based on like where I'm working at, oh, yeah. and so that's not a lifestyle that everybody wants, right? Um, some, you can't put down roots right now as it is, um, just because of the nature of you're always kind of moving around. So yeah, if if the LA area thing wasn't necessary, that'd be super cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I've been hearing like a lot of the same thing too and um that's that's part of the reason why I, I ended up being in a really lucky situation and I I am very aware of a lot of my situation being uh personal luck because I would say it's the silver lining of like what the pandemic's been for me it's super it's been a weird it's a weird thing to talk about and think about because there's yeah because there's been so much like global trauma and just like so much happening over the last two years but um I, I will say like the the positives that have come out of it for me and have helped me realize a lot about the lifestyle that I want and what I want out of this has been that I got to do this traineeship at home and then even hired on afterwards full time. And I can't be a member of the union because I am in Florida and I'm only here because the offices were so closed. Like I always had the option to go over, but also moving across the country in a pandemic just was like how are we going to do that? Like, are we going to fly over? And, you know, and this was also like pre vaccine too. So it was, it was just, it was very dicey and we didn't know what to do about like my husband's job and stuff too. So we just decided, okay, we're going to stay here until, um, you know, offices open back up and, you know, we kind of need to be over there maybe a bit more. And, uh, and even so without being a union member, I, I think I still like, <laughs> I, I still make like, with the cost of living in Florida being as low as it is compared to LA, I still like come out ahead of the, the curve. If that makes sense of what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. like um, I think the union is needed to protect wages. And I think I'm in a very special situation for that, mm -hmm. but I would love if the pandemic um, on the other side of this, we can still open up doors for people who are in a situation like me who like didn't have art school and isn't in California, but then also for people like in Europe, or Asia or Africa or like as long as you guys can swing time zones because mm -hmm. I know that's a concern too with production but like I did that I just worked a noon to nine schedule mm -hmm. which I know is easier to balance and say you're like on the other side of the globe but like if that's something you're willing to commit to and make work then like that's a lifestyle choice that you can make if you want to do it I would love if that kind of opportunity opened up for people and I really hope it does because I think people like me and others on my crew who live in like Australia made it work too so like i don't know who knows <laughs> yeah definitely I, I feel like there might always be a bit of a preference towards in person because there's just <laughs> certain communication things or certain things that are just like it's easier to like bond in a lot of ways for like a, a, a production um and just like certain like just all these just small things that are kind of complicated um that just sort of build up and um, I think it's definitely, I feel like it would be super awesome if like interns and like could like continue to do things virtually because like not a lot of people can afford to move to California. It's so expensive. And if you're only getting paid like, you know, an internship wage, it's kind of not worth it. And you kind of need to be in a privileged position to take yep. these opportunities. Yeah. Um, luckily the training program pays you pretty well. So you can afford living here, at least in the Nick Artist Program. Um, and I was in one of those positions where I literally moved, <laughs> pandemic started. I was, I just like stayed for a couple more months and then they gave me the opportunity to just like move back home. Um, and then, uh, when I got my new job, they did need a California address. So I decided to move back, um, and like have a place, um, so I could continue a different position. But unfortunately it's just such a complicated thing and, I think it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of it and hopefully it will open up. And I, I honestly think it will because of 
how much people want it. And, and I think if like as a union and just like as an industry who keeps fighting for it, I think it's very possible to make that change. Just that everything takes time. So, yeah. yeah. And regarding the union, because Diana had asked about that in the chat, that is something that the union is working on and it's in flux. I mean, the answer to the question is no one knows, <laughs> you know, no one knows and everyone's trying to figure out, as we've all mentioned, with the union, part of it has to do with health insurance because our health insurance is tied to California state law. So part of it is health insurance. Part of it is that the union was created back in the 50s when it was assumed everything will be in LA. Also part of it is that the animation union is part of IATSE, which is the bigger entertainment union. So it's not just our decision, it's a decision that I believe would have to also go through all of the entertainment union as a whole, representing everybody. So, but it's a thing that they're constantly talking about, and it's a thing that in union, union meetings, they're talking about that. So, and also it's the fact that the pandemic's not done. You know, people are still getting COVID, it's still around, they're, they're still getting the vaccines out. So we might be in this situation, sadly, for years. I think based on what everyone has said and just what I've seen at Nick and Warner Brothers, a lot of people are more open to people being in other countries and other states, especially because a lot of the executives and the higher ups are looking at this going, well, this means that I don't have to live in LA. So if they don't have to live in LA, then their team members also don't have to live in LA. And it's also just opened up opportunities where I know on both Loud House and Santiago and Warner Brothers, you know, we're meeting candidates that are awesome that don't live in LA and they're getting hired because it's, well, you're, you're the best candidate and you're great and you're in another state and that's fine because we're all on Zoom anyway. So we'll go ahead and hire you and we'll figure this out when we have to, which we don't know when that will be. So I think the ultimate answer is, no one knows so just keep applying for jobs and save up money in case you have to move but you might not have to mm -hmm. yeah that's been the story of my last year i think there were times because i started in february but the interview process and stuff started in january and at first we thought we might have to move immediately and then it was okay we don't but we might have to when the vaccine starts rolling out you know, and becomes more um, mainstream and like, you know, back when that was a thing in like April. And so we thought, okay, April to June might have to move again. And then it became, okay, August, September might have to move again. And it's, it's been funny how like this date has just kept getting like can kicked that now we're just like living in flux of like, I don't know what's going on. We're just going to take it one day at a time and like see what happens. <laughs> Cause it's, it's just hard to plan for stuff like that in this era now. So there, there's gotta be yeah, a level of like flexibility on my end, at least in my situation. <laughs> I also think, sorry, I just thought of this. Another thing studios are thinking about doing um, that has been on me and my husband's radar uh, because we're, you know, living in Florida, like cost of living is very, very different than it is in California um, or even just like also uh taxes like florida doesn't have an income tax and like the thought of that in california like pff, blows my mind like i don't know how that works even like just as an adult <laughs> i don't know how like what the, what's that like mm -hmm. uh so there's just a lot of things about it that i know would be like a huge learning curve and just uh adjusting and figuring that out especially as i still find my footing as like a professional um in this industry like consistently right mm -hmm. i think uh I'm I'm just very happy that I've had the the grace like the the grace period to stay here where I am because if um or wait sorry I have lost my train of thought oh that's it oh, sorry about Netflix studios Netflix and I have to, I think other studios maybe they were going to um people are talking about the flexible week where it's like oh maybe you only come in two or three days a week or we're gonna see like do you only have to be there for art review days right. and we're looking at living maybe not in Florida if that happens, but also like a little further out of LA where like I could drive in, but maybe it's easier for us to own a home outside of that if we could swing that. 
Mm. Um, so there's a bunch of different possibilities where like, sure. I don't mind driving six hours a day if I only have to do it once or twice a week, Jeez. but doing that Monday through Friday would suddenly become very difficult. Um, so that, that's another thing to consider too. Like I've heard people talk about that might happen, but it also might not. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, they've talked about that at Nick too. Like I've had like production managers ask me like, would you want a hybrid schedule? And a lot of people have said, yes, that would be great. Especially because, I mean, even in LA, I know a lot of people that have moved from LA to other parts of SoCal and have gotten to get bigger apartments or have gotten to buy a house because they don't have to drive in every day. So now they live one, two hours away. So who knows? Who knows? You know, that's the thing. Nobody knows. I think it's just the thing of just keep applying, save your money, and just be prepared for the day, but then know that the next day they might change their minds because that's how it's been. Because like Abigail said, you know, two weeks. Yeah, we're um, almost two years into our three-hour tour of being at home, so no one knows. No, no one knows how all of this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question, Bobby. So is anybody else on the question call? If not, we can answer because we had a couple of people that asked some things in the Q&A. Oh, yeah. Go for it. All right. So let's go. We have one from Anonymous. So they wanted to ask if there's a recommended time that they that ah, let me let me just read this directly. I just want to ask, when is the recommended time? that you would submit your applications for a trainee program. They're saying that they noticed that their friends' applications weren't getting viewed and it was heartbreaking. And they know that people are busy, but they just kind of want to know how you pass your application. So I think, I think the kernel of the question there is, does it matter when you apply? If it matters if you apply like towards the beginning of the program or towards like the end date of the application program. <laughs> I applied on the last day okay. of the submission period <laughs> for the Nickelodeon Artist Program. Like I woke up with a start that morning. I was like, <gasps> something, I had to do something important today. Oh my gosh, it's the last day to send my application to the Nick Artist Program. <laughs> because they don't look, and that was okay because like they, cl- they, they closed submissions at midnight that day. And then they started looking at all of the applications and they look at all of the applications. So in my case, it wouldn't have mattered if I applied early on or towards the end. If it's a regular job, like you saw the posting on LinkedIn, um, my intuition would probably probably be apply as soon as you see it because they're going to get a lot of applications. I mean, I'm not speaking from experience, unfortunately. That's more just like intuition. Um, like trying to imagine like if I was on the receiving end of all those applications. But but the Nick Ryers program, uh, I applied to that on the last day. But make sure you do that. Don't do it in like the last hours before midnight, because um, like the website, the uploading page crashed on me, and I had to redo everything. And it took me like three hours to like the whole process of filling out the application and there was like an essay and stuff. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also ended up applying kind of like on the last day or two. Um, it, it really, it, I feel like it doesn't matter if it, it like, there should be specs on like the, the trainee program, like website or whatever, like when to apply. Cause they, uh, if they say that they're going to look at it, they're going to look at it. They're not going to not look at it. You might not be getting like feedback or you might not get a response, which really sucks. And I get how like frustrating that can feel, but I'm, if you submitted, they're going to look at it. Um, so I would just apply whenever you feel like you have everything together and you're confident um, within the allotted time period. And if there isn't like a specific date or like time, um, I'd still just apply when you feel ready or like when you know if you have your stuff together just apply you know there's no harm in applying like it's free like like Angela was saying it's free you don't need to pay money to apply so (laughs) Uh, oh sorry go ahead uh Cynthia Nunes do you have a question for the panel are you on the call I see her there Cynthia can you hear us hi Cynthia 
Hello? Maybe her mic's not working. I think her question is written if we just want to read it or something. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, Cynthia, hop on. Hop on once everything works. But until then, we'll just read your question to make sure it gets answered here. So Cynthia writes, I've heard several times to reach out to hiring managers online through LinkedIn, for example. I'm always afraid of coming on too strong or desperate. I really enjoyed the in-person networking events hosted by Wea and Alexia, but most of them have, are now virtual. How do you network or reach out to other professionals, especially because we are still working virtually? It's a great question. So tips for reaching out to people without sounding desperate or it's too strong or insincere now that we all live on Zoom. I feel like um, at least for me, or like if people reach out to me, I usually respond. So if you wanna reach out to me, feel free. But um, I, uh, when people do reach out to me, they usually kind of try to establish some sort of connection, whether they like are commenting on my Instagram posts or, or they just randomly reach out. Like for the most part, if it's like an artist that like, I mean, I know that some like huge artists are probably not going to like respond because they probably get thousands of questions a day. Um, but usually like smaller artists have the time to respond. Um, so you can always just like pop a question. But also, if you really do want a response, just do your research, like show that you care about this artist and you're interested in their feedback. Like, I definitely get questions every year when the Nick Artist Program runs around and they're like, what should I put in my portfolio? And I'm like, that's the most vague question. <laughs> like, I don't really know how to answer that, especially because I don't actually know you. So it's like creating a virtual connection can be a little complicated, but if you do your research and you like care about the artists that you're actually talking to, most of the time they're gonna give you, and you just have to be considerate of their time. Um, and in the same way with recruiters, like it can definitely be intimidating, but it's actually their job to recruit people. So like you reaching out like at, you know, whatever time of day, like it's like if they have, the, obviously they're not always gonna have the time to respond. Some people recommend like reaching out exactly at 9 a.m. So then like their email is the first email on the top. So then a recruiter clicks it and looks at it. Um, so there's like different like tips and tricks, but like reaching out to a recruiter isn't really gonna bother them because it is their job to, you know, look for artists, so. Um, it can definitely be overwhelming, but I definitely feel like there's no harm in it. Like, unless you're being like super like weird and like creepy about it. And like, like to the point where it's like, if someone were to ask you a bunch of questions every single day about like, Hey, did you look at my portfolio? Did you look at my portfolio? Like, obviously maybe that's a little too far, yeah. but like, just, just be realistic or use your social skills. And obviously social skills are kind of weird during quarantine, but for the most part, like nine out of nine times out of 10, people are at least going to look at your message and maybe they won't respond, but that has nothing to do with you. It's just that, you know, people just don't always have the time. So just keep looking because there's people that do want to help. This is such a big industry. I mean, it's small, but it's big at the same time. Um, and there's a lot of people that want to help you. So just keep looking. Yeah, I think Shannon nailed it. Um, I, I, I think... Cause I, I still ask this question sometimes. And so maybe for something um, a little more practical to also get your hands on, uh, I would talk to artists and recruiters almost like depending on what outlet you use a little differently. If you want to email recruiters, a great way to just start that connection. If you're starting from nowhere and we're in the zoom era, it's just like, hi, my name is so-and-so I'm currently looking for exposition, whether it's, you know, prep designer, blah, blah, blah. And just say, um, I'm currently available for full-time and part-time position. And here's a link to my portfolio. Like I would love to connect, like you just basically want to say like, here's my availability and here's my portfolio. And then if there's ever any update on that, um, like an update to the portfolio in like two months, three months, like that'd be a good time to like, Hey, I would just let you know I've updated my portfolio and I've also just applied to a position I saw, you know, just like little updates like that. It's those little things that are great to send to recruiters because they typically keep that stuff on file somewhere, especially if they're interested in you. Like that is their job. There's so many programs and stuff on their computers that just keep track of that. And then they forward that to art directors and such as needed when they have a position open. So I would just say like that. And then when you start with, even if it's a cold email, if it just says that, that's a good way to start a relationship. If you're messaging an artist on Instagram, 
I mean, Shannon just really nailed it. Like start some kind of like, I don't want to say like relationship because like, it's not like, it's hard. Cause you're not like meeting in person either. It's weird, but just like interacting, comment on their stuff and just be like, Hey, this is really awesome. I love this or, you know, whatever. Um, and then eventually, like, if you do reach out and ask them a question, you know, give them some background, like she had said, say who you are and just like, Hey, I'm interested in this. Do you have any pointers on this specifically? Don't ask vague questions. Also, don't just say hi. I've gotten DMs before, even in like the music world, where it's just a single hey from a stranger that I've never seen before. And I get, yeah, I get scared to answer them because like, I don't know what's coming because I used to answer them and it would get weird sometimes, like, like a little dangerous weird for me to the point where now it's like, I don't, I don't want to talk to this. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so if you establish that background and make it clear, like you're just asking for some pointers as a, you know, a student or trainee or whatever to a seasoned professional, you know, they want to help you. Like they, they, they really do. Even the ones that seem higher up, there's a good chance if they don't get to your, you know, DM or whatever, it's just because they're busy, but they're really trying. So I hope, I hope that helps. (laughs) Yeah. When you said like, Hey, and hi, don't be like people on weird dating sites the dating sites aren't yes. weird but don't be because that's what people do on dating sites i'm just like hey what's up it's like no don't don't do that don't do that also to Alyssa and shannon's point when you're writing to professionals and you have questions ask them questions that you're that are not easily found on google so the thing you don't want to do is how do i get into the animation industry don't don't ask them that because that's that's why rise up exists and black and animated and Asian animation, there, there's so many things for that. But if you have something really specific, like, hey, I see on your portfolio that you did these types of props for backgrounds and you're using Blender. I too am using Blender. Mm. Can I ask you a couple of questions pertaining to, like, if, if you like really drill down, then A, it shows that, oh, you care, and B, oh, you've been paying attention. So when you reach out to people, like, specific things, but also get to know them, like the first, email or Instagram message or Twitter message, you don't want it to be, hey, your work is cool. Look at my portfolio. Give me all the reviews. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> like, like give, give it a little bit of time. Yeah. And when you send someone a question and they're kind enough to answer it, please thank them or reply to that email that they took an hour to write to you because that's happened to me before where somebody really wanted my advice and they they asked me to review their portfolio and I did this for them and then that was the last I heard from them like they just ghosted me after that and that was really frustrating and um it doesn't give a good impression of you as a professional you know part of being a professional is yes the way that you reach out but also having the courtesy to reply be like thank you Mm -hmm. for your time and maybe even continue the conversation. Uh, yeah, that'd be my only thing to add. I mean, it doesn't have to be long. Oh, sorry, Bobby. No, 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 no. no. Uh, I mean, like, I, I, I will just say, like, I was one of those people trying to break into the industry, sending emails a ton. So uh, to a lot of people, and like everyone on the panel said, just kind of know the boundary, know when it's too much, and reach out. If they do respond back, send them a thank you. Um, but I will say, I mean, like everyone's been there. I mean, like, I mean, like when I get those emails and I'm like, you know, just like, who is this person? But like, um, you know, if you can, or if we're fortunate enough to reach out to people that remember what it was like to reach out to people when they're trying to break in, um, then there is that, um, there is that, uh, you know, empathy there. And right, the empathy kind of comes from, um, listen, you're, you're working really, really hard. I can see that you're working really hard. Your demo rear portfolio shows me that. And then also, like and to Angela's point, you're asking questions that are maybe a little more specific to your portfolio, right? And not just kind of that googly um, thing that anyone can kind of find out, right? Like, what does it take to be a character designer? Well, there's a lot of resources out there. But like, what if it's like, if you rephrase that of like, um, I'm struggling with draftsmanship or I'm struggling with um, a graphic design or shape language or 
um, you know, those kinds of things, um, you know, getting a little more specific towards your, um, uh, like where you are and where your portfolio is now. Um, and, you know, at that point, you're just talking to, you're just talking to a colleague at that point, because you're talking shop, you're talking design, you're talking draftsmanship, you're talking drawing and painting and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, like I, 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 I did that a ton. <laughs> like I emailed everybody. And then the thing is like, like for every 50 emails you send out, you'll probably get three responses. That's okay. Yep. That's fine. You know, don't get discouraged. Those people are busy, like everybody said. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, that's part of it. <laughs> I think I, you know. And that's also the worst case scenario, right? It's just, you don't get an answer back, but no that's one funny. is out there being like, how dare you talk to me? Like it's, that's literally the worst case scenario. It's just, you don't hear back, but for yeah. everyone that you do, you're going to be really glad that yes. you did it. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, what's going to happen 10 years from then, you're going to remember what it was like to get a response from that person. So when someone sends you that email, you're going to be like, I remember what it was like to get a response from that person. And it, how it changed my, like the course of my portfolio. So paying it forward, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah. good. Cynthia, that's your good, dogs huh? are out there. Cynthia, did you have yeah, any questions? Yeah, Cynthia. Um, no. <laughs> okay, cool. Did that answer your question, Cynthia? We, we, uh, I just kind of rambled for two hours. Oh, okay. oh she put in the chat. Yes, it did. Thank oh. you. All right. Oh. Denny, Denny's on the call. Denny, did you have a question? Wong, Denny Wong, hello? No question. No question. Okay, cool. I don't know. Who are, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I just saw it in the chat. That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Oh, that's oh, no. okay, Denny. That's all right. Well, hey, no, if you have okay. a question later on, we're happy. Even if you don't want to come on camera or speak it audibly, feel yeah. free to type in it. If you have a question later, that's fine. Yeah, sorry, Denny, to put you on the spot. Um, okay. But, uh, well, but. let's go over then to over the Q&A. So Mariah had a question. Oh, this is a good one. What steps can I take to grow and maintain my relationship with my mentor? Ooh. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's a tough one to put, like, because it's kind of asking, like, how does a relationship develop, right? Which is kind of hard for me to, like, verbalize on the spot and, like, think, like, yes, this is how that would work. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to kind of, like, uh, um, think back to, to what that was like, I, um, it, it feels a lot like school. So, like, and, and even my mentor have told me like working in animation will often feel like the way high school does or college where it's like every year you graduate and the graduation is like the production wraps and you're all like oh my god my friends who you had the same classes with and stuff and then you go to your next production and it's like the next year and you have like a new schedule and new classes with like you kind of see some of the same people but it's a lot of different people too and you're like oh, okay we're still in the same school but it's different now too that's animation so my best comparison is like, it's going to feel a lot like what getting close to like your favorite teachers were in school, a lot of um, like making your, your best friends in school where some of them, maybe you talk to them more some years than others. Um, I feel like with my mentorship, I mean, again, it was over virtual stuff. So like that might make it a little different, but uh, we met up at, I think we spoke with each other every single day, at least once. And it was between various like Google meets or check-ins or office hours or whatnot. Um, but a lot of times that kind of relationship is just created organically because we, we just worked with each other and saw each other just like how, like when you're placed in a school, just being in the same class as people, you kind of like forced to like get to know people. Um, but like in a, in a positive way, right. Cause your mentor is there to help you. Um, and, and then that relationship just will keep growing organically. Whereas now, I've worked really closely with my mentors for like eight months and I feel like I could just reach out to them whenever, even if we're not on the same show and like chat or ask for help or advice. Um, and so some of that will just kind of happen naturally. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
Abigail, what do you think? Communication, yeah, is the main thing. Talk, talk to them pretty regularly after the production wraps up at each other on on Facebook and social media if, if it's appropriate. Um, in, <laughs> my, in my cases, it always has been. Uh, and then it's really easy to just kind of send a message if I'm asking about maybe it's a role, maybe it's I just want to catch up with them or show them a different change I've made in my portfolio. Uh, yeah, just... I, I think that's that's the most if, if we were working in person, I would say, you know, have your have regular one on ones, right? Grab coffee mm -hmm. and walk around and talk with each other mm -hmm. and uh, regularly, you know, share your work with them, whatever you're working on. Uh, yeah, but, but that's the main thing. Just just keep up that communication. That's good. Yeah, that's great. What do you think, Shannon? Um, I was pretty shy. I don't know why. <laughs> not really that shy of a person, but I was kind of shy. Um, and then my mentor was also doing this for the first time. So she was also kind of shy. So we're both kind of like this awkwardly maneuvering. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but we're, we're kind of... Like every time I, you guys met each other, it would be like this. How do we keep the handshake? <laughs> and it's like shy friends <laughs> but um what she really appreciated is just when I would like go out of my way to just like write like some email being like okay this is where I think I'm at and this is what do you think and like just obviously I couldn't always do it in person because I was just like really weirdly shy for some reason but I just send an email or just communicate how you can communicate because obviously it can be nerve-wracking and then there was like the pandemic and then like she was also the art director so it was like okay I have to be respectful of her time and also figuring out like how she's doing things and then sometimes I would just be like hey can I just sit in on x meeting and like listen to this breakdown or whatever um which was really helpful but um I think it's just kind of like what everyone else was saying was just like communicate and just like and even in like small ways um and like adding each other on social media or like you know sharing each other's work or whatever you know just like small things to show that you like care even if you can't always like be like have like this buddy buddy relationship we're best friends for life like at the end of the day you are professionals and this is a job but um just showing that you care in a small ways all that i think really matters because for me like i'm sure if i ever see her again in person in this crazy world like she still like made a huge impact on me even if i haven't been able to be like best friends forever or whatever so yeah <laughs> small ways of communicating and showing that you care is i think goes a long way I, I mean, I will say that like the best people in this industry remember what it was like uh, in the beginning, you know? Um, so, I mean, like they will have the empathy for like, you have a ton of questions, you're very shy and very awkward. So, yeah, it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> I'm awkward now. We all start <laughs> off as awkward caterpillars and we bloom into somewhat less awkward and more confident butterflies. Yes. yes. I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Fantastic. All right. So then we have a question from Veronica. So Veronica, oh, we touched on this earlier, but we talk about a little bit more here. How can you tell the difference between production work and an illustration? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question I get asked a lot. So I feel like it's, it's a good one um, to answer. Pretty much an illustration is a standalone piece. It exists to communicate one aspect of maybe it's, it's, um, it's an illustration on a website. Maybe it's an illustration in a book, right? But with production art, it's ideation. It's a lot of like kind of thought processes. It's sketches and things that are going to help that film or that cartoon develop into its final look. So when you present an illustration in a portfolio, you usually just show that illustration. It's complete. It's beautiful. It's on your portfolio. When you're showing production work, uh, ideally, you want to have like a layout that you're using for a portfolio where you show your thought process behind that piece. Maybe you did a lot of thumbnail sketches and you show like all the different variations 
that you went through before getting to that final design and then have your final design like there on the on the page because that's really the heart of like concept art it's 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 all of the ideas and the kind of rough sketches that get thrown out and like the stuff and, and, and instead of delivering a finished piece it's more about the it's more about the thought process so um that's something i really recommend to any visual development portfolio it's like show your thought process they really want to see that they want to see the sketches of like how many different shapes you tried for your character how many different silhouettes before you settled on that final character design uh because it's important for them to see how how you think and if you're still not sure how a portfolio page should look like for like production or like animation right and like as, as opposed to illustration like i said like check out those art of disney art of pixar movies books and see how they kind of like lay out like they'll they always have like the character painting of like rapunzel and then a bunch of sketches like on the this page next to it of what she looked like early on in the production um that's i think a key difference some yeah maybe someone else can word that in better or in a different way art of books are really great um i i think i think uh like what Abigail's talking about is a lot of like iterative work. So it's like, it's a lot of like finding that concept um, and getting out a bunch of ideas and then uh, choosing then what they want to use. I think another aspect too of production work that is the like less sexy stuff that you see on Instagram is like the very practical drawings that they send to the modeler. If mm -hmm. you work in CG, this too. Um, so like, a lot of the work that I'll have to do on dad is like, um, not just turns, which is common in 2d, but then also in 3d, you have to worry about like, uh, textures and stuff too. Um, so being able to either call that out or paint it accurately or both, um, that also makes you, I think more hireable or like marketable. If you want to do that kind of work in a CG setting, like, obviously this is not like a 2d thing, but like being able to basically whatever you hand off, whether it's a building, a creature, a prop, whatever, they need to take what you have packeted and they give it to the 3D people and they give it to the modeler. And the modeler just has to take, without talking to you, the thing you have on the canvas and make it exactly the way um, the art director and you intended. So you just have to make sure like you have that information there. So if it's a building, what are the textures? Um, you know, what are each little grooves like in the, in the details, you know, or how detailed do you want it to be? Is it just like a plain old like brick building? Um, that kind of stuff too. And you can see that in the art of books. Like, I think I have the tangled art of book behind me and there's some like brilliant, um, like the inside wooden scaffolding stuff of the tower that looks like super technical, but that kind of stuff was needed to model it as well as the iterative conceptual work that is also like all over the book. So I second the art of book thing. You'll get a good idea of like the different kinds of things that you'll need to do. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. And then we have one last question from Diana. So she wanted to know, what trait skill of yours do you think was the most helpful during your time as a trainee? So the one thing where you're like, that this was the thing. Oh, solid um, drawing. And that's usually what I mean by solid drawing is you understand construction. And what I mean by understanding construction is that when you build your characters, when you draw them, you can turn them in any angle really easily. You understand what those shapes are and the character looks dimensional it doesn't look flat because that's like the biggest um that's i think the, like the biggest piece of feedback i give like like when i've had students is they, they there's great things going on with the character designs but they need that volume that volumetric kind of drawing where you see this in like those old disney sh like like behind the scenes right where they have like the line going down and across the face and things because if you know whether you're drawing props or you're drawing characters 
or even environments, you're going to have to turn a lot of stuff in space. Like you're going to be able to have to draw things from a lot of different angles and being able to do that quickly was a skill I used all day, every day at Nickelodeon. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. I can agree with that more. It goes into the draftsmanship stuff. I mean, even if it's a 2D or 3D thing, um, 3D obviously, but like for 2D, those animators are going to have to turn those characters and props and environments, right? So they need to know what it's going to look like from every angle. So that's, yep, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would probably have the exact same answer. It's definitely like the, the fundamental of draftsmanship construction, like knowing how like shape and form works. Basically, that's like your number one, yeah, uh, number one in the tool belt. <laughs> you gotta have it. Mm -hmm. I would also say, um, uh, and this is a bit different from like art skills, but also just uh, being curious. Mm -hmm. I, I think everyone likes having an enthusiastic, curious per person on the production, whether you're a trainee or not, because it goes back to that whole like, we're artists, we're always learning, and people like being around that. It's yes. just a good positive vibe. So yep. just, you know, add to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, to your point, Alyssa, the, that, that like, um, curious, positive personality goes a long way. And you don't really, you, you don't have to fake it, right? Just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, a, um, like, there's this whole adage of just kind of like, we would rather work with someone who was like positive um, and uh, like you said, curious, but the skills weren't necessarily there, but they're great to be within the room versus mm -hmm. someone who's amazing, but a prima donna. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So no one wants to work with that person, um, no matter how good they are, because there's a lot of good people out there. There's not a lot of people that um, you can find where you're like, oh, I love seeing this person every day, because that's what it is, seeing them <laughs> every day. You know what I mean? Uh, whether it's through Zoom or, you know, when you eventually go back into in-person stuff, but yeah. Angela yeah. can probably speak to that too. I mean, like, you know. Absolutely, yeah, because it's, I love what Garnet said a few weeks ago about vibe check. You know, it's just, mm. we just want to know, especially when we were in the office, yeah. can, we be in a, can we be in an office with you? Eight uh -huh. hours a day, five days a week. That's what it is. 51 man. weeks out of the year, one week off for Christmas. Are we going to enjoy that interaction? Will you be coming to all the meetings? Will you be a positive force? Yeah. Will we just sense your presence with feelings of dread. So <laughs> he's the one that people, and that doesn't mean, and I, I was very quick to say this because I'm a very outgoing person and I recognize that the majority of people in animation are on the more introverted, shy to themselves side, which is perfectly fine. Totally fine. You can succeed, many, many, many people succeed without being super extroverted. Yep. You don't have to be the life of the party. Yep. But you do have to be present. So if you're, you know, if you're present on Zoom, if you're present in person, you're paying attention, you're listening, you're answering questions, you're kind to people. That's what people care about. They don't care if you're like party king and queen. They just care <laughs> if you're nice. <laughs> uh, man. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, Shannon, what do you think? Have you? Um, yeah, definitely fundamentals and... Um, pretty much everything that they just said. I'd also just add like, um, I think personality goes a long way. Like even when people are lacking in fundamentals, if you have like such a fun personality in your work, it, it can be seen and people will pick you because sometimes people are just so strangely honest in their work or like just like make really funny stuff or just really interesting stuff, even when they struggle a lot with fundamentals. and. <laughs> sometimes to me that's the kind of work that's like really exciting is someone that's just like is so openly honest themselves even when they struggle with with the foundation but it's a great point definitely recommend the foundation like it's it's never not going to be beneficial yeah. but like personality also goes a really long way um so just something to think about um if you feel like you have the greatest fundamentals ever like which i don't know everyone struggles with fundamentals at some point um but always personality is such a big thing so yeah 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 
Well, that's awesome. I mean, I know what you mean, because you can have the greatest fundamentals, but also still kind of be like, um, uh, I don't know, like me when I was growing up as a kid, like shy and dry. I don't know. Like, uh, no one can see your personality. But, uh, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Some, sometimes those weird portfolios are just kind of like, yes, let's bring them in. They're going to shake things up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but what do you think, Ange? Uh, uh, so thank you, everyone. Did, yes. guys, you, you've um, given us a lot of your time since 11. So it's gonna be, uh, yeah, you guys have answered so many people's questions. Thank you so much thank for you so much, being a part oh, of the panel. You. And thank you to everyone who listened in and joined us. Yes. You know, those of you here in the States or other countries waking up really early Wow, that's that's dedication. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you to all uh, the panelists, um, Melissa, Abigail, Shannon, for you know, uh, <laughs> like um, you know, sharing your time with us this morning. I know it was really beneficial to the um, community, and we're right there. So what we're trying to do sometimes is like bridge the gap of like we're really close. They're really close, and you know, just kind of like that encouraging word or that kind of inspirational word, uh, educational word from, from panelists like you can kind of make all the difference in the world. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah. I'm so happy to be here. Cause I, I was definitely like, I mean, I was just there this time last year. Right. And I remember people asking me like, so do you feel like you're close to a job? And I was like, nah, I still feel like I'm maybe like a good three or five years off. Like I still got a ways to go. And then it, like January hit and I was like, oh my God. So like, yeah, stay in there guys. Like, you yeah. know, keep working, but like you can do it. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Cool yeah. But just thank you guys. I was, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank everyone. Yeah. So glad to have all of you and just also our, our little, our little PSA at the end. Join Rise Up Animation. You can meet mentors. You can yeah. meet others. We have a good Discord community. And there's a lot of other good organizations. There's Women in Animation. There's Last yeah. Next, mm -hmm. Black and Animated, Asian Queens, Asians in Animation, Creative mm -hmm. Society. There's a lot of great groups. A lot of them have Discords. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be alone on your artistic journey. No. Schoolism, Lightbox is happening. Mm -hmm. After when this panel's over, go check out Lightbox. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff, you guys. Yeah. Oh, Bobby, Bobby, oh, you're muted. Oh, you're no. saying wonderful things. We can't hear you. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was a fire, <laughs> fire truck light passing by. But thank you so oh. much, Angela, your dream, as always. And uh, uh, thanks, Bobby. Well, you guys in the industry, hopefully we get to work together at some point. So the industry is small. Yeah. I'm sure mm -hmm. we're all going to work together at some point on our own show, which, uh, <laughs> which is going to be amazing. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody for being a part of this and um, yeah. hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend, great week ahead. And um, this will be, we'll let you know when it's up on YouTube soon. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. You too. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have yeah. a great Bye. rest of your day. Bye. 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 B